This is the voice of the Report of the Week, signing on. Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone listening in to today's broadcast of VORW International, the new podcast. Welcome, one and all. Hopefully, it is Friday, the 19th of February, 2021. At least that's when I am aiming to get this program out. I hope everyone is feeling and doing all right. And I hope you're having a fantastic Friday, or whatever day it might be, when you're listening into this program. Today's show, as you might see from the title, is going to cover, well, first and foremost, uh, we'll address a few matters of business, but then most importantly, uh, we will be discussing, at least in a, you know, in, I don't know how long it'll be a discussion, but we'll talk about the 10-year anniversary of my YouTube channel, The Report of the Week. And I'll just impart a few thoughts in that regard. And then after that, uh, I do want to get to a bunch of emails and miscellaneous topics that we have there. Of course, as I say at the beginning of every show, if you're tuned in right now on YouTube, I have four pieces of fan art that I would like to direct your attention toward. The first piece of fan art was sent in from Savano, More of her work can be found on Instagram at instagram.com slash vintage star art. That's vintage star underscore art. You could find the link to that in the description. She also had a comment. She said, I know the 10 year anniversary of your main YouTube channel is coming up, so I wanted to make you something for that. Congratulations on this milestone. You've come so far. I hope you take some time to recognize that about yourself. Well, thank you, Savano, for your wonderful fan art and for your kind words as well. The second piece of fan art is credited to Johanna in Germany. And in explaining the piece, she said, In the Cajun Flounder Sandwich review you did, you mentioned that you had a dream in which you were singing songs dressed up in a fish costume. That inspired me to make the fan art that is attached to this email. I used watercolors and pens. I hope you like it. Thank you, Joanna. I thought it was great, and I got a laugh out of it. Very, very nicely done, and thank you for taking the time to make this piece. The third piece of fan art is from Dylan from DCM Entertainment in Oregon, United States. And the fourth piece of fan art is from Lucas in Germany, who also had a comment. He said, I often heard that Florida is a really weird place, very different from the rest of the United States. Something that could confirm this statement is the popular Florida Man meme, which always shows some crazy and random crime connected to the Florida Man. So maybe you could talk a bit about Florida and if it is really as weird as I imagine it. So Lucas, thank you for your fan art as well. And uh, just to quickly get to your question, Now, I have lived in Florida for a few years. I can't say that I have spent my entire life there, and I can't say that I know the state inside and out. Uh, One reason why so many strange stories come out of the state of Florida is because of something there called the Sunshine Law that allows many of the records in regards to crimes committed uh, available for the public and the media to view and obtain. Now, most other other states don't have these sunshine laws. They uh, really keep things more confidential. But Florida is very open in regards to many of the uh, crimes and wrongdoings committed in that state. So as a result, um, because it's just easy for the media to peruse through and see if there's something newsworthy therein, uh, that's why so many interesting stories come out of Florida. I guarantee there are many crazy types in New York and California, etc., Um, but because Florida has the Sunshine Law, all of this information is easily uh, identifiable and accessible, again, by the news media. Now, granted, that isn't to say that Florida is not a boring and weird state. Uh, One thing about Florida is that there are a... It it is a huge blend of all different sorts of individuals and cultures and perspectives and politics, etc. That you put all these different people in this one location, and uh, granted, strange things will sometimes happen. It's really quite a melting pot, and uh, (laughs) you really you do you do see some interesting things that I will say. So maybe Florida is a little weirder 
than uh, some of the states. Uh, but I will definitely say that, again, the Sunshine Law is one of the reasons why the state has the reputation that it does. But again, there's no denying that strange things do happen down there. So thank you, Lucas. If anyone listening in is feeling artistically inclined and would like to create a piece of fan art to have featured in the next broadcast, all you need to do is draw up or create whatever you would like, and then email it to me at v-o-r-w I-N-F-O at gmail.com. Email it to me there as an email attachment, or upload the image to an image hosting site and email me the link, whatever is easiest for you, and simply let me know how you would like to be credited. Be that by name, by a social media profile, by a website where more of your work can be found, etc. So again, if you're feeling artistically inclined, it'd be a pleasure to feature some fan art on the next show. And finally, before we get into the rest of the show, this program is often demonetized and understand that the sponsors of this broadcast really help keep it going. They keep the lights on, and if you would like to support this program, either consider advertising, it's very affordable and effective, and simply send me an email if you're interested, just shoot the question, and I'll certainly try to work with you to get a rate that you can afford. Email me at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. And otherwise, if you would like to donate to support this program, you may do so via PayPal at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com or via Patreon at patreon.com slash the report of the week. And with that, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. This is V-O-R-W International. The future of crypto is here. Rubik Exchange. Interest in cross-chain decentralized finance, DeFi solutions, is rising. Here's why RBC is the future of trading cryptocurrency. Rubik is a decentralized cryptocurrency exchange. Unlike other exchanges, such as Uniswap, Rubik bridges between financial assets and does so with lower fees. This isn't your ordinary coin that brings nothing to the crypto ecosystem. Rubik is a gateway to the future of cryptocurrency. Rubik is a multi-chain DeFi ecosystem, which features cross-chain, peer-to-peer, and instant swaps across multiple blockchains, including Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, and Matic. Rubik is a complete one-stop decentralized platform. And coming soon, Rubik will also help your money grow with yield farming. By providing liquidity for trades, you will be rewarded with RBC tokens when trades are executed. So why not check it out now? When financial regulators decide to crack down on crypto, Rubik and its exchange will be the gateway to multiple exchanges. The central crypto exchange. The future of crypto is here, Rubik Exchange. That's rubik.exchange. Rubik.exchange. Check them out. So I'd like to start the program off, of course, with the introductions aside, granted. Uh, The title subject, the 10-year anniversary. I'm sitting here this evening, I'm, you know, trying to think, well, what, what do I want to say? I know that I have had previous anniversaries and, you know, previous anniversary shows and, you know, various videos and programs that commemorate certain things. One thing that I don't really want to do is sound like a broken record and say, you know, the exact same thing every single time. But at the same time, you know, you don't want to go out of your way to try to say something new and just, you know, kind of have it fall on its face. So I'll try to be at least somewhat succinct. And I guess I'll just try to take what I'm feeling and, to the best of my abilities, express it into words. But I'm sitting here this evening. I know you can't see me, so you could just imagine, because I figure... This is a program that, at least in part, is commemorating, I would wager, a very significant anniversary with this YouTube channel of mine. I decided to dress, well, somewhat more formally as I'm recording this broadcast tonight, 
Because why not? I think a 10-year anniversary is an occasion worth dressing slightly better for. So tonight, by the low light as I'm recording this, I have on a uh, gray double-breasted vest. I've wore that vest in a couple, won a couple pictures, and in the review for the Panera Bread um, flatbread pizza, and I'm wearing some matching uh, gray pants as well, black shoes. And then I'm going with a white uh, wing collar shirt, a red tie to kind of match the red tie that I originally wore 10 years ago. And then number one, because it's a nice formal addition, and number two, it's a little chilly tonight, I have on my frock coat, and I have that buttoned up on top of it all. So I'm going, you know, a bit a bit more formal this evening for the occasion, and uh, at least giving it my giving it my best shot. Although, to be fair, I've I've worn an ensemble just like this for no reason whatsoever. So it's it's not like this is my special ten year anniversary outfit or anything. I just thought, ah, eh, I'll wear the frock coat tonight, break it out. But ten years, my goodness, ten years. I, how long and how short a time that's been, right? How much has changed in that time? Yet in some ways I reflect back on 2011 and it, well, it most certainly doesn't feel like it's been 10 years ago. You know, I was looking through my channel and I was re-watching some of my oldest content and then I skipped ahead five years to 2016, where I did the five-year anniversary, and now, of course, five years after that to, well, to 2021. I can't believe, number one, how much I changed, especially in physical appearance, in the first five years. You know, from my very first video to the five-year anniversary video that I did in 2016, which it was mostly a review. I reviewed this Sunny D energy drink, so if you want to find it, that's how you could search for it. And the change, of course, with that is very striking, but then the change, you know, from 2016 to 2021, aside from some of the technical parameters, uh, I think I look much the same. You know, maybe just a little thinner, and my voice might be slightly different, but that's really it. Now, that's just in general appearance, but then, of course, when you break things down year by year, how crazy it is, and what a ride it's been, let me tell you. I'd like to take it right back to the to the start, from day one. What, you know, what even started my YouTube channel, The Report of the Week? What was the motivation, what was the inspiration behind it all? The YouTube channel, The Report of the Week, started simply for fun. It wasn't something that I started to try to get views. It wasn't something that I started to try to get to this number of subscribers or try to make any sort of profit from it whatsoever. I wanted to do it purely for the fun of it. Originally, the resources were all there. I remember in December of 2010, I had this flip camera. It was a flip minnow camera, which surprisingly recorded in 720p at 60 frames per second, which is, I'd say, pretty good for 2011. But I had it, but I didn't really have anything to do with it. You know, that was the thing. I had this camera, but I didn't, I wasn't internet savvy at all. I had no accounts anywhere. And honestly, I just took the camera and made, like, some, you know, little home videos and stuff and, and filmed random things around the house, really, and that was it, just for the fun of it. But, you know, there was no... There was no basic structure or anything. It was just making little tiny clips for fun here and there, again, of random stuff, you know. So I just say that to basically outline the fact that that's where the resources to even do the videos and film them came from. Now, secondly, getting into the idea. You know, why energy drinks, why reviews of all things, uh, etc. I remember in early 
2011, I think it was. Maybe it was late 2010, even. It might have... The initial idea might have even came about in December of 2010, and now that it's been a decade, my, my exact memory isn't perfect. But I recall at some point during that time, seeing all these ads on television, seeing these commercials, going through the supermarket, and seeing all these different types of energy drinks. All this colorful packaging, this bright packaging, these claims saying that this one is the best, this one is, you know, it revitalizes your mind, it keeps you up at night, you know, it, it, all these things, that it, it enhances your performance. And you have to remember, energy drinks, I think, were a lot more popular, so to speak, 10 years ago than they are today. Now, that's not to say energy drinks aren't unpopular right now. It's just, I remember in 2011, you had all these different types that were being advertised. There were so many sponsorships and sporting events. You still get that, but it was like, I remember on television, every other commercial for a time was for five-hour energy. And I remember there was this guy, you know, in a shirt and tie at the office saying that, you know, you, uh, you want to combat that, I think he said that 2.30 feeling, and if you got to get some energy, drink five-hour energy, and it'll get you through the workday, etc. You had all these energy drinks. You had Red Bull, you had Monster, you had Rockstar, you had Rip It, you had Bing, you had Amp, you had... Oh, gosh, the list goes on and on and on. There was so much out there, and I thought to myself... I wonder what these things really are, you know? Do they really work? I see all these claims. The packaging looks interesting. I wonder what this stuff even tastes like, you know? I have I mean, at the time, I had drinking tea and coffee, and I was just curious, like, all right, what do these beverages taste like? What do they do? What, you know, what's the, uh, what's the hype behind this? So, I think it was in late 2010. I went out on my own, and I, I bought a couple energy drinks. I bought... Red Bull, I bought Monster, and I bought a couple five-hour energies. And personally, on my own first, I wrote down on a piece of paper a little bit of a chart. And I remember I had these different categories and the names of the drinks, etc. And I personally was just going to do a little bit of a, a personal study just to see in my own view, just from personal experience, which one is the best? And I just wanted to do this for the fun of it. Why not? It was just an idea that I had, and I was just genuinely curious. I wanted to see which one's the best. So, during December of 2010, usually on the weekends, because I had school and I had to... <laughs> I didn't want to ruin my sleep at that point just yet. So, you know, each weekend I would try out an energy drink. And I believe the very first one that I tried out was Monster. And I thought, oh, wow, you know, this is pretty good. <laughs> I thought to myself, oh, my goodness. Yeah, this tastes much better than I thought it was going to. I thought it would be all bitter and everything, but wow. Yeah, this tastes good and kept me up till 3 a.m. too. This is, this is great. Then the next week I tried out Red Bull. And I thought, wow, you know, this tastes pretty good too. I mean, you know, I think Monster was... My favorite, but yeah, Red Bull, this is pretty good also. And then I tried out 5-Hour Energy, and I wasn't a fan of that <laughs> at all. I didn't like it much at all, and I just had tried out one at that point, and I didn't like it. Now, there wasn't any sort of epiphany. There wasn't any sort of, you know, moment where a little light bulb materializes over my head and shines to life or anything. It simply happened one day, I guess I just, it all hit me that, hey, you know, I had the resources, I had this camera that I really wasn't doing anything with. I was doing this study about the energy drinks. Maybe I should just film myself reviewing them, why not? And uh, upload them to YouTube, have a YouTube channel, publish the uh, reviews and uh, just see what happens, you know, just for the fun of it. I, I'd i never really done anything on any social media before, ever. So I thought, eh, this might be, be kind of cool to do. 
So that's exactly what I did. The idea came about, and I decided to go ahead, sit down on a Sunday afternoon, get the camera on, and film an assessment of five hour energy. Now, the first time I ever turned the camera on and began doing the review, there was an initial error in filming. And at the time, my video editing software on my computer was so primitive, it, there was nothing that I could do about it. And I had to do a second take. The second take was actually the very first review that you ever saw. That's actually, so that's really the second review I ever did, but that was the first one that could be properly uploaded due to an issue with the first take I ever did. And I thought that I lost that first take. I thought that I must have just deleted the file or something back in 2011, or maybe it just got lost in the ether somewhere. Um, but if you would believe it, about a week or two ago, on an old flash drive, I actually found that first take that again, at the time, I wasn't able to upload it because like the video was upside down or something. And there was just, again, I couldn't fix it at the time. And I thought it was just lost. And I found that first take. I saved it to my computer. And now in my video editor, I of course was able to get it now to a viewable form. And uh, tomorrow on the 20th, I'll uh, upload that to the Report of the Week channel so you can see the real first video that I ever did. Because again, the first one that you see on my channel right now, before the 20th, that's the second take. So this is the real, the real first number one video that I ever did. And I hope it's enjoyable. But th that's just, that's just an aside. I remember that evening though, after we finally got a video done, I made the YouTube account and originally I wasn't even gonna name the channel the report of the week. Um, I wanted to have something like weekly. I was thinking maybe like the weekly report, um, the weekly review or something. It wasn't going to be the report of, it was going to be the weekly, again, report or the weekly review or something. But those usernames were taken. And of course the name stems from the fact that I had initially intended to simply do one review per week every Sunday, and that would be that. I thought that I was just going to continue my study regarding energy drinks, find out which one is the best, and leave it at that. And once I find the best one, my work is done, and there's nothing more for me to do on YouTube. That's that. This is just a way to post the findings online. And again, that's the end of it. Then I remember, about a week later, of course, when the time came to do the second review. And this, I think, especially was when even my own idea that early on in regards to the channel began to change. I remember it clear as day sitting there again that afternoon, and I tried out Monster. And I remember so clearly after, it feels like it was yesterday, it really does, after the camera was off, and that review was done, it wasn't even uploaded yet, but I remember sitting there thinking to myself, you know, this was an awful lot of fun to do. This was, you know, I know I'd only just done two videos at this point, but wow, I mean, this is a lot of fun. I'm able to sit here, share my thoughts, have a little bit of fun, crack a few, you know, silly jokes, and just kind of make it my own little show. This is, this is, this is really neat. And I remember even then thinking, you know, it'll go on for as long as it does. Because it was, and still is, something that I genuinely enjoy doing. And that passion for it despite having started 10 years ago, has not abated. It's still there, it's still going strong, and it's so wonderful to be able to do these shows for you, be that in video form or 
online in audio form or over the radio. It's really just fantastic. And over these last 10 years, that's not to say that it's all been good feelings and it's all been smooth sailing. It most certainly hasn't. Almost every single year has been filled with its ups and downs. You know, even a few months later, in 2011, I'd say after about 10 reviews that I did, uh, I hadn't ever told anyone personally about it, um, but eventually someone at my school found out uh, about the reviews that I do. And, you know, the reactions were mixed. A lot of people actually were very supportive, and I was even then surprised by it. I mean, you know, who knows what people say behind your back, but that's just life. Um, but, you know, there were still a few folks who, you know, even in 2011, kind of made fun of me uh, for doing the videos. Because, yeah, you know, I was weird. <laughs> it's, what, you know, I'm a young teenager at the time, <laughs> wearing a full suit on YouTube, uh, doing energy drink reviews. And for anyone who was curious, the, the suits weren't any sort of costume or anything. Even a decade ago, I was wearing suits casually, just because that's what I like to wear. I've, I've pretty much always been that way. But even then, I remember in, in 2011, thinking to myself, you know, I know that some people are out there laughing at me. I know that some people are making fun of me. And yeah, it hurts. Um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, you know? There was a time, even in 2011, where I was contemplating uh, shutting down the channel that early on. And eventually I decided against it. I thought to myself, no. People, they will say what they wish. But in the end, this is what I enjoy doing. I like making these videos. I want to make these videos. And I'm going to keep making these videos. And I did. In 2012. Again, the year had its ups and downs uh, in terms of, of trolls. Um, but I guess really it was in late 2011. 2012 saw the introduction of the Running on Empty food review series. So by that point, I was reviewing energy drinks still, but I was also reviewing uh, some fast food, which now I think the Running on Empty is the most well-known one. But at the time, the energy crisis was the, uh, you know, the flagship series, so to speak. That didn't really change until maybe 2015, when Running on Empty became more popular. But either way, uh, 2012 again had its ups and downs. Even in late 2012, I was starting to experiment with different types of content, including just random, um, you know, long-form talk programs, which you know, were mostly the equivalent of pilot episodes, so to speak. Now, up until this point, even into 2013, early 2013, the YouTube channel, in terms of its viewership, was relatively stable. Uh, it garnered a small amount of views, but I think, like I said in the last show, and I, I had already talked about this, so I won't dwell on it too much, a small amount of views, but a very nice, albeit small, community of regular viewers. Uh, up until 2013, I had about 200 subscribers, and again, maybe like 40 regular viewers or so. Maybe less. Maybe it was 30 or 40. But seeing their comments and their words of encouragement and some of their messages, etc., really, the lot of that gave me the motivation to keep this going, too. They had suggestions about things to review. Um, you know, they always had, even if it was constructive criticism or just, you know, it was just, it was a very nice community, though. They were genuinely helpful in a a group of good people. And, you know, I got to know them. And it was a really nice atmosphere. And again, the views were, you know, very low. I was getting maybe, uh, on average, like 20 to 50 views per video, with a few outliers that maybe had 500 views, and that was it. That's all that the channel was getting. Um, then everything changed in early 2013, when a video of mine, uh, did get some popularity, a uh, review of uh, Domino's Pan Pizza that I did. 2013 was a year of great change for this channel of mine. 
you know, not only for the channel, but personally as well, mentally. Because when I started out 2013, it was like a continuation of 2012. It was, again, the small community, and, uh, and that was that. But right off the bat, in 2013, a video of mine got 200,000 views. Again, the uh, Domino's Pizza review, which I always mockingly call the Pan Pizza <laughs> review. <laughs> it's just a, an inside joke, kind of, just how I, how I say it in the video. <laughs> I, I get a good laugh out of that, honestly, but... This is... <laughs> I, you know, I remember that video, of course, I was shocked. At the same time, while I was surprised in a pleasant way at all the attention that it was getting, and all of a sudden this channel overnight, after two years of only getting 200 subscribers, suddenly gets, you know, 3,000 subscribers, and hundreds of thousands of views, you know, not much of the attention that came in at the time was necessarily positive. Again, I understand now, looking back retrospectively, you know, same reason why a lot of the people at my own school kind of looked at it in a mocking way. You know, you're just this, you're like this little kid in a full suit trying to seriously review these items. And while some people will look at that with impartiality, a lot of people, I guess they just can't help but, you know, either gawk at it or make a crude comment or what have you. And I know now that that's just how people are. But a lot of the attention that I got at the time wasn't necessarily positive. It was, you know, people like, you know, <laughs> you know, dude, look at this, this guy's so weird, or, or something like that. Now, granted, I still get quite a bit of that today. But to me at the time, you know, it, nowadays, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't care what people say about me. It just is what it is. Um, but at the time, you know, not having really been exposed to much of that, those sorts of things, again, did hurt a bit. And it actually got to the point where it was just too much. It was just too much for me. I didn't know how to deal with all of it. I didn't know what I was doing. It was just, like, too much at once at that point in early 2013. So for my own good took a break for a couple months from YouTube. I returned in, uh, I think it was maybe April or March of 2013. And I was back at it, reviewing the energy drinks and doing some food reviews. Now, the rest of 2013 was pretty smooth, but then late 2013, things took a bit of a, a downhill turn. Because a website that I think is now infamous, even at the time then in 2013 it was infamous, uh, 4chan discovered my videos. And originally, I had no idea what 4chan even was. I just started noticing around August of 2013 that videos of mine started getting more views than they normally would. And I remember I was able to go through the statistics and I was able to find that a lot of the views were stemming from external traffic, from a website called 4chan.org. And I visited it, and I was kind of browsing around, and I wasn't really sure what the point of the site was at that time. I was kind of confused by it, and I didn't see anything. Um, but, you know, the views from that site kept coming. And eventually, I guess I just did enough digging that I finally found, I think one day in maybe September, it was, a thread about my videos on the fit board, the, uh, the fitness board of all places, if you, you know, if you, it's kind of funny that that's the board that my stuff was, was being passed around on at the time. But I remember sitting there that afternoon reading that thread. The thing that you have to understand about 4chan is that it is an anonymous image board. And in part, I think it's just, you know, the nature of the site, it's just how people are. You know, there's a lot of trolling, and, and people will say things that they wouldn't necessarily say on any other platform. Um, but at the same time, the anonymity does allow people, for better or for worse, to say things that they wouldn't necessarily say in any other circumstance. And the things that were said about me at that time, in 2013, 
I had never heard before. I mean, it put any sort of ridicule or gawking or whatever that had happened previously, um, completely, that made that stuff look tame. And I was really, really deeply hurt at the time. I'd never seen these things before, and it was just one after the next, after the next, after the next. Video after video, day after day, week after week. Now, no one came after me personally or anything, but, you know, the things that were said about me, having never really been exposed to this stuff before, it just... it hit me hard. And it couldn't help but weigh down on my mind. And mentally, I went through a very dark period. You know, I believed a lot of these things. I thought it was true. I thought, you know, really, I am that worthless, etc. All these things that, you know, I won't dare repeat. But it was just, you know, you see enough of that, you come to hate yourself. And then you start thinking worse things. And this continued through... Uh, late 2013 through early 2014, finally into mid-2014, because I still enjoyed doing the videos, and, you know, eventually I had just accepted that, you know, all right, this sort of ridicule and hate directed toward me is just how it's going to be. And eventually I started to, you know, I was looking for something different to do. So that's when I began the VORW series. You know, I was already starting to get into shortwave radio, I was starting to get that interest in it, and I thought, you know, it might be a good time to just change it up and do something different, and uh, start doing audio work. So, uh, you know, at that point in early 2014, that's when I started up VORW, and of course that's the show you're listening to right now, that's been going for seven years. Eventually, after I started doing that, that kind of served perhaps as enough of a buffer to drive some of the trolls away. Um, because a lot of folks were just looking at the videos and were looking for things to make fun of and, uh, and all of that. This long-form content, who's going to sit there and really sift through an hour worth of it? So uploading a lot of the VORW stuff actually drove away a lot of the trolls. And... You know, I went through some tough times after that, and then, you know, some people were upset at me for doing too much of the audio stuff, and I felt bad about that, and I made an apology video, and, you know, it, it was tough. I was very conflicted. But things worked out. Because after I made that video, the apology to all, I realized that while, you know, there were a lot of bad voices out there, a lot of people who just relentlessly attacked me, so to speak. And a lot of the time, those negative voices seem to be so much louder than the good, I've realized that there still are some good folks out there. That still some of those good people that even supported me early on were still around. And that there were new viewers, too, who over really the last year had begun to, you know, they, they enjoy what they saw. And uh, they supported, you know, whatever I had wanted to do with the channel, VORWs, etc. And through that, through that rough time, they were there to give me some words of encouragement, and that really helped. So starting in mid-2014, things really um, began to take a, a better turn. And I was kind of able to emerge out of that darkness into, even at the time, I almost called a new golden age for the channel. I began uploading content much more frequently, finally peaking, I think, in like July and August of 2014. I was uploading literally every single day, sometimes twice a day, and I was doing everything. I was doing food reviews, energy drink reviews, and VORW podcasts uh, day after day after day. You know, I was really going. And the drive was, was back. The passion was back. And I was becoming better equipped mentally to try to tune out all those nasty folks out there and not let their words try to get the best of me. Late 2014, I began to run into some health issues. You know, things continued into 2015. Uh, starting in mid-2015, I began to do the, uh, 
I tried to re-emphasize a lot of the running on empty reviews instead of just focusing on like frozen foods and baked goods and supermarket stuff. I started refocusing um, those reviews on popular new releases from fast food establishments. In 2015, I also began doing the shortwave broadcasts of VORW, and, uh, you know, then we just continue. Then in 2016, the channel began uh, attracting more and more views. With that again, though, uh, 4chan in some aspects uh, began to, you know, cause some issues again. Although this time in 2016, there were some folks there that uh, certainly had my back. But midway through the year, in 2016, again I was dealing with stalking and organized harassment, and once again, by the summer of 2016, I was unsure if I was going to be able to keep this going again at, at this point, because I was, you know, boundaries were being crossed, and I was worried for my own my own safety and, and that of those close to me. But once again, that storm did pass, and in late 2016, the YouTube channel reached the 100,000 subscriber milestone. It had reached the 50,000 subscriber milestone in 2015, 100,000 in 2016. Into 2017, it reached 200,000 subscribers oh, at around maybe April of that year, March or April. I was also able to restart the uh, shortwave broadcasts full-time every week, and those have been going ever since. Then in 2017, the videos and the channel continued to grow. I reached 300,000 subscribers in around maybe May or June of that year. 500,000 subscribers in October or November of 2017. Then in late 2017, I did a video um, just about my skincare routine, just for the fun of it, and I was so shocked to find that video wound up on the YouTube trending page, something that I never thought a, a video of mine would ever wind up on. In the 2018, the channel really began to um, gain some momentum at the time and was favored by the algorithm. There were multiple trending videos early in the year, and by June of 2018, the channel reached 1 million subscribers. And really, from 2017 on, I would say late 2017 to present, I kind of mentally think of it as like the modern <laughs> era of this channel. I've kind of been managing it and conducting it the same way ever since then. And uh, surprisingly enough, in 2020, the YouTube channel reached 2 million subscribers, and now here we are, 10 years later, in 2021. So incredible. You know, I didn't plan on going through the chronology of this. I'm just thinking to myself, just all the... Well, what a journey it's been, you know? It certainly hasn't been all good, but it's... It's had the good times and the bad. It's had some very, very high points and some very, very low points as well. But in the end, I stayed on course. I persevered. I kept the channel going. Why? Reason number one. Because no matter what people say or try to do, this YouTube channel, these broadcasts and these radio shows, are what I enjoy doing. It's what I like doing. It's what I want to do. I have fun with them, and it's an absolute pleasure to do them each and every week. And I didn't start this channel out trying to make it my job. It's fantastic that it ever wound up that way. But I began doing it again because it's just something that I enjoyed doing. And I remember I really, I really remembered and learned that the second video I ever did. The second reason, and I would say even more important than the first, is the wonderful audience that has been here along the way. Yes, that's you. I'm talking about you. The folks out there right now watching and 
listening, your emails, your comments, your feedback, your messages of support, your suggestions, your criticisms. It's all so incredible. Sometimes emails and comments will come in from people who I know, I know mean it sincerely, say that, you know, these these videos, these broadcasts, these podcasts really help me. Maybe they help me mentally or I'm going through a real tough time and hearing them is able to calm me down and it's able to get me through these times. And I know that they're said sincerely, but it's just so... It's so unbelievable to me, you know, to know that what I do is even able to have a remotely positive effect on people. It's, it's unbelievably incredible. And what I say to the folks who say these sorts of things, and I mean it most sincerely, and I'll say it now, it's the listeners and the viewers just like you that truly give me the motivation and inspiration to keep this all going. To those of you out there tuned in right now, thank you for your listenership. Thank you for your viewership. No matter how long you've been here, you could be here from day one, could have been here for the last seven years, the last five years, the last year, the last month, the last week. It's such a pleasure to be here right now to broadcast this show to such a fantastic audience. Over all of these years, thank you all so much for your support. And despite enjoying what I do, I know in those really, you know, those dark times, I don't know if this channel would be here without you. So thank you all so much once again for your viewership, your listenership, no matter how long it's been, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. It's been 10 years, and you know what? I have no sign of stopping anytime soon. I'm going to be here as long as I am. I can't predict the future. I don't know how, you know, you never know what tomorrow holds, but who knows? Hey, maybe we'll make it 10 more. You never know. So thank you again for your support. And to all those of you, and I think this could really be applied in many ways. If you're just working on something, if you're working on videos, if you're working on a project, if you're making music or writing or drawing, whatever it might be. And maybe you like doing what you do, but things are rough. Times are rough. Things are difficult. Maybe the world is just, well, it's being cruel to us. Maybe people are just being nasty. Maybe things just aren't turning out the way we hoped. But if you've got your heart in it, and deep down it's something that you still want to do, please don't give up. Over these last 10 years, there are many times where I myself contemplated giving all of this up. Times where almost all of the nasty people out there, I almost let their words completely get to me. I was ready to just delete everything, shut the channel down, quit, and just give everything up. I know sometimes in that lowest point, in that darkest moment, when things just aren't again going the way we had hoped, sometimes the reasons for quitting, well, sometimes we get in a rut and those reasons seem more and more valid. But take a moment to think about it. Think deeply. Think hard about it. Think about what you've put into it. Do you still have passion for it? Do you like doing what you do? Remember that we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what it holds. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what's going to happen a year from now or three years from now. It never once occurred to me in those very low points in 2013 that even just three years from now, I'd have 100,000 subscribers and three years after that, I'd have two million subscribers, a wonderful community, and being able to do this as a living. That never once occurred to me. And had I given up then, 
I know for certain that my life would be so drastically different now. None of this ever would have happened. Hang in there as best you can. Try not to let the detractors and the trolls and, yes, the haters, <laughs> as silly as that term can sometimes be, get the best of us. I know that their words can hurt. It's hurt me before. But try to the best of your abilities. I know that's easier said than done. But try to just take it one day at a time, one step at a time, and try not to let their negativity, their hatred get the best of you. Because remember that in the end, that's what they want. Stay true to yourself, what you believe in. Take it one day at a time, because you never know what the future holds. When I started this channel out, I never thought I would be here for 10 years, and that it would ever, that it would ever amount to what it did. Never once did I even think that remotely. I wish you all the very best of luck, and whatever it is you might be working on, or aspiring toward. Just remember, you don't know what the future holds. Thank you again sincerely for your viewership and your listenership. This is VORW International. Next up in the broadcast is the Mailbag Show. The name of this program is self-explanatory. It is where I open up the metaphorical mailbag of listener correspondence and I see what you, the listeners, have to say. The program has no set topic, no you know, rules or anything. The way to reach me is simple, via email at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com, and I'll try my best to get to your correspondence. If you have any questions, any comments, any pieces of feedback, topic suggestions, anything interesting you saw or read or watched that you'd like to share, any miscellaneous anecdotes or anything, it's a clean slate, send me an email again to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. Correspondence for the last show was a bit light, despite good listenership, so please don't hesitate to write. Send in an email, long or short, it's great to hear from you. And likewise, as we said at the beginning of the program, if you are feeling artistically inclined, you're more than welcome to submit a piece of fan art, again as an email attachment, to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. If you have a shortwave radio, I regularly broadcast to North America every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday evening at the time of 9 p.m. Eastern, that's 8 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Pacific, on the frequency of 5850 kilohertz. That's 5.850 megahertz. Again, if you have a shortwave radio, I openly encourage you to tune in. It's a nice hour of some music, some discussion on current events, and some random talk. Overall, it's a fun show, and again, I hope you can tune into that broadcast as well. If you are interested in any information about the medium of shortwave radio, if you'd like to get a shortwave radio, again, some general information on the medium, if you'd like a detailed broadcast schedule of VORW Radio International, because there are ancillary broadcasts targeting Europe, South America, North America, and portions of the Pacific as well. So there are other ways that you can listen in. And again, any questions, um, I'll be happy to get to. Reception advice, radio recommendations, etc. are welcome at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. It's something that I could talk about all day long, so don't hesitate to uh, write in. So as I was going through my inbox on this cold night, you know, there wasn't a ton of new correspondence, so of course... <laughs> New feedback is always welcome. I know there are folks out there listening, but um, there was one interesting thing, I think. I don't know what this was. It was kind of strange. One thing that I said last week, or however long ago this really ends up being, that really must have... I don't know if it struck a nerve with one person or a group of multiple people. It was just all very strange. I was talking about the internet... And um, it's just my take, and I proudly stand by it. I remain steadfast uh, in that I don't really think the Internet is as free as people think that it is. 
you know? And I get that people have their disagreements, they're entitled to it. And, um, there were a couple legitimate disagreements, you know, that came in, which is fine. Again, I, I respect your view. And then there was one person, and I'm, I'm almost convinced, I would say convinced at this point, that it was one individual who for some weird reason thought it would be nice to, um, like in a very crass and crude way, of course derogatory, send like a, a good group of emails from all different addresses, but at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, you know, you do realize I pay attention to the times that these all get sent at. If you're going to try to do that, make it a little more realistic, and don't pretend it to be a mob of people, but then send it all at the same time. Uh, you're not you're not winning that game if you try to do that. At least space it out a little if you want to try uh, to even go for the most basic amount of realism in that sort of trolling. So you can do better than that. But, um... Yeah, aside from that, there's a couple emails that I do want to get to. But one thing that I want to start the mailbag show off with is, uh, for the last show, there were a lot of emails that I just wasn't able to get to. And, um, I just thought the topics in them were so good, they deserved to still be addressed. So, you know, all of these emails, I already responded to all of them, and I said, look, you know, I think your email's fantastic. I'm going to be getting to it in the next show that I do, not this newest one, you know, previously had been recorded and uploaded, um, but this one right now. So I just want to let people know, look, I appreciate your email. I want to talk about it. I'm sorry I didn't in the last show, but it will uh, this time around. So with that said, let's um, pick a place, any place, and uh, let's go from there. So we'll just go... uh, Go with this one. Starting it off is an email from Manta, who writes, Hi, John. In one of your latest podcasts, you talked about the Truman Show movie. I remember seeing that movie as a kid. First, I liked it, but then in the end, I thought it was very depressing, because that guy's life was all fake. Nothing was real. All your friends and loved ones were fake, and that's kind of depressing to me. I didn't even think of all the monitoring, the cameras that were there, just the fact that all of his loved ones were not worthy of his love because they were all acting. Anyway, that reminded me of this one specific disorder. It's a form of paranoia, officially called the Truman Syndrome, where a person believes they're being monitored by cameras all the time, and on top of that, even being broadcasted to an audience 24-7. I'm just wondering if there's any weird mental disorders that you've heard of that fascinate you. Uh, One of the most fascinating to me is the delusion where you think you're more or less dead, called the walking corpse syndrome. Uh, So thank you, Manta, for your email there. You know, the Truman Show, I mean, to me it was a sad and and depressing um, movie. Now... You know, who knows, maybe I have something wrong with me, who knows. But sometimes, when it comes, like the Truman Syndrome, like I know for a fact, I am not Truman, you know, in the Truman Show. I know that for a fact. Although in some cases, you do have to just look around at the world and wonder what is even uh, real at this point. You know, what's really real and what isn't. And, um, I mean, you know, who knows, maybe the whole existence is a simulation, but if it is, I'm just going to go with it in that case. (laughs) But, um, one thing that always interested me, you know, not really a delusion or anything, but I think it's called the problem of other minds, right? Let me just look this up. That's just an interesting thing that, um, it's a saying, well, how do we know that other minds exist, right? We experience our minds directly, but it seems that we can only know of other people's behavior. It's uh, just an interesting thing. <laughs> but that's that's for another day, perhaps. I just think it's, um, I just think that's interesting. But what I was saying is, um, well, in regards to being monitored, I mean, I do believe that I am monitored uh, 24-7, but I, I think we all are, um, you know, through our phones, through our computers, Uh, our electronic devices, 
I guess I'm part of the camp that thinks that, you know, they are exploited and used for surveillance. I don't think, though, that there are, like, you know, camera crews and cameras hidden in, you know, my lampshade or something that are broadcasting my life as a television show or, or anything like that, right? I don't believe that. Um, you know, but I do think, like, in my case, that... Well, for instance, the microphone on my computer, maybe this microphone when it's connected to anything, the microphone in my phone, um, any smart devices, any smart cameras, anything uh, can and probably are used by, uh, number one, the big tech companies, um, maybe for data collection, maybe for personalized ads, maybe for surveillance, and by the uh, federal government, so I think they do keep tabs on me. That's I personally think that they do. And that's just a part of life. You know, you could say, well, just don't participate if that bothers you. You know, you can just get rid of the internet. But in, in, <laughs> it's not so easy as doing that, in my case especially. I mean, without the YouTube channel, I'd probably be homeless. and um, And that would be that. But it's not like I really can do much about this. I'm kind of one of the people, I always put the tape over all the cameras and everything, I always keep certain devices unplugged, etc. But again, you know, it just is what it is. It's just the, the way the world is uh, in, in the 2020s now. But again, this isn't for any sort of mass audience. And I've heard, though, of, again, like the Truman Syndrome, where, yeah, some people do think that um, they are Truman in the Truman Show, and that, you know, when all the cars... They're stuck in traffic. They think that was all coordinated and that, you know, the car is pulled out specifically for them, etc. And I've studied a lot of that stuff very extensively, um, but I just think that's just a mental disorder. Jessica in Michigan checks in. John, review bra, good internet, sir. I simply wanted to send you an email expressing my absolute adoration for your incredible show and your wonderful, wholesome pr presence on the web and your person in general. You make so many folks, including me, smile, and I wish you the best. You deserve it beyond what I can say, and we all appreciate you. I hope to eventually uh, send you some fan art. I drew a sketch of you once and put it on Reddit, but perhaps this is a better spot for it. Can't wait to continue tuning in to VORW. Thanks for all you do from Jessica. Well, thank you, Jessica, for your kind words. It really means a lot to me, and uh, as for fan art... Of course, you're more than welcome to post the fan art on any avenue uh, that you wish. Um, the best way to have it featured in the broadcast, if you would like, again, is to send it in via an email, and uh, just let me know how you would like to be credited. And uh, by all means, I'll be more than happy to feature um, any of your work on the next show that I do. So thank you for, uh, for your email. I really appreciate it. We hear from Holly, who is uh, tuned in. Well, she was listening in on the shortwave on 5850 kilohertz, um, but also sent in a, uh, you know, a comment that I thought could be useful for the, um, for the show. So, uh, she said, yeah, I'm listening in on, uh, WRMI. And just a, uh, side story for a future broadcast. I've never been into prepping until about two years ago when we bought a house that has a bunker. All of a sudden, I realized how unprepared we were. We barely kept a couple days of water and food. We never bothered with backup power or heat sources. When I first started, I sort of thought it was a fun hobby and something new to learn. I watched a lot of YouTube videos and read books. Fast forward and I am now starting a company to help others prepare. I keep two years of food and water, backup heat and power supplies, and even car bug-out bags. I know you've spoke about being prepared before, as you have to be ready for hurricanes, but uh, it seems since the pandemic started, more people are becoming more interested in prepping and being ready for everything possible. Because of my hobby, I was able to keep my whole family safe and secure. Do you see more people being open to getting prepared? Maybe ask your listeners what I asked my mom. What would you do if power, water, or gas was turned off for four days? This is an eye-opening question for most. And it seems the older generation blindly feels prepping is not necessary 
until this comes up. Looking forward to the next broadcast. Not entirely sure why I listen, but I'm hooked. I find your topics interesting uh, and a nice break from news. Keep up the great work. Thank you from Holly. Well, thank you, Holly. Uh, I thank you for your shortwave report as well. Glad to hear you were tuned in on uh, 5850 and uh, prepping. That is something that I advocate, and I know some people laugh at you, etc. Um, but, you know, again, people are entitled to their view. I'll do me, you do you. I don't really see um, what harm to the world I'm doing by just wanting to be ready for a, uh, a disaster. I don't, I don't really see any harm in that. I mean, I know some people out there listening um, would like to see me die in the next hurricane that comes up, but, you know, I hope to avoid that if I'm able to. And um, one thing, of course, that can, can certainly help is uh, having a little, bit of, a little bit of extra. Now, I think like you, you definitely know, there is all sorts of levels of preparedness one can have, right? You could have the simple, like just some extra batteries and some extra food and stuff, a couple jugs of water here and there, right? Then you can go to the next level. You can have bug out bags. You can have like a, a kit or something. Then you can go to the next level beyond that. where You can have all of that, but then a greater stockpile of food, um, you know, various different supplies for circumstances. And then finally, it's like where you have a whole, like a safe room and everything. I mean, it's just, how far does one want to go? I think that's the good thing about prepping, though. There are all sorts of, of different levels of it that you can do. You can just take it by your personal comfort zone and go from there. Sometimes I think some of these shows that were popular at least a couple years ago. I don't really know if they are anymore, but I think we've still heard of them, like these shows that, I don't know what channel they're on. I always call these sorts of shows like TLC <laughs> shows. <coughs> TLC. Makes me laugh that that channel, you know, there was a day when it was called the Learning Channel. <laughs> yeah, that's just kind of, it's a real bad joke. I shouldn't say that. But, you know, you get these shows like Doomsday Preppers and stuff that kind of show the most extreme um, preppers. But I think in some cases that's more of a turnoff for some than it actually helps. Because it makes people who are interested in that just seem like they're insane and that they're ridiculous and that they go over the top and that, you know, they're all just nutcases and they look so foolish with all this stuff. So I don't really like, I guess, the stereotype that that, that show perpetuates. Um, because I, you know, I strongly advocate, you know, being ready. There's nothing wrong with that. Look, you know, we can fear, right, fellow individuals on this world. Lots of other people are capable of doing very bad things. Um, but one thing that we also have to always keep in mind is uh, nature, you know? Severe weather, one of those topics that, for some reason, people kind of tune out. But weather happens every single day. Sometimes it's worse than others. You know, those folks of you in the Midwest know that derecho that hit uh, last year, you saw what that was capable of. You saw what it did to the infrastructure in your area. People out there in the West Coast, you see the wildfires. You see what that's capable of doing. In the southeast, hurricanes, you know, all this stuff, tornadoes. In the northeast, you could get hit with, um, you could get hit by hurricanes in the northeast. People don't really think about New York getting hit by bad storms, but I mean, we got Sandy, we got, you know, well, Irene wasn't all that bad, but you can get bad storms. Even Tropical Storm Isaias. Did a real bad, uh, had a bad impact up here. And there are times, like I think it was in the 30s, when a Category 3 hurricane hit Long Island. That stuff can happen. It will happen again one day. The real strong ones, the major hurricanes, can make their way up here. So the Northeast isn't immune. It just happens less frequently. Earthquakes, and then of course you have civil unrest, contagions, 
etc. All sorts of things that can happen. These are the events that can realistically happen one day. Let's hope that it's not. But just because something is unlikely does not mean that it never will happen. And I would have, you know, would have hoped that the severe weather that happens year after year after year... I'm just pouring some extra water out. Going with bowl and basket. Spring water. Again, that minimalistic design on the jugs, let me tell you, I keep buying them purely for that reason. Plus, it tastes good, too, but... The aesthetic, I love it. I am a regular customer of theirs now, simply because of that. But I was just saying that I would have hoped, you know, that the severe weather, etc., would just be a little bit of a wake-up call for some. And I think it is for those who, you know, have been directly impacted by a storm or whatever. Um, but then the thing is that I realize it's harder to prompt people into action than you think. And, uh, you know, if someone's mind and heart just isn't committed to it, it's not going to happen. I just try to be ready. I'm not perfect at all, but I try to just be ready a little bit. And I try to advocate it to others as well. And again, when it comes down to prepping, you know, it's not all just about storable foods, etc. Um, of course, you have to focus on that. You have to focus on, you know, water, water pur uh, purification... Uh, lots of things from the medical point of view, too. Our bodies, you know, hopefully will be in good shape, but, you know, sometimes you don't know what the future holds. You know, again, power generation, just general navigation, uh, communication, of course, you know, self-defense, self-sustainability, uh, all sorts of things. Now, again, you know, it's also like, what do you want to be prepared about? Uh, that's just a question that one needs to ask themselves. Right, you, and there's just guides all over the place online. So many existing uh, wonderful resources. Take advantage of it. You know that. All right. Well, let's say I live in the Midwest. Do so I want to be ready then for severe storms, especially? And there's all sorts of things that you can look that would be best to have. Now, I know money's tight, and these things usually require some excess cash. So that's the thing. One thing that I realized earlier uh, last year. People can do prepping here and there and just build up gradually if you want to go that way. But it's like, well, what do you want to prepare for? What is your concern? And there are guides for every concern. I mean, I kid you not, there are. If you're concerned about blizzards, there's guides for that. If you're concerned about hurricanes, there's guides for that. Earthquakes, civil unrest, government control, anything. Diseases. You name it, there's guides for all of this stuff. Every every single thing. A lot of it, of course, crosses over from one to the next, but you know, it's just a matter of what what concerns you, and then there's things you can do about it. I advocate prepping. I think not only is it practical, I believe, and you've heard me say this many times on the broadcast, better safe than sorry, but I think also it is a way, uh, in some instances, that it does also help ease certain types of stress. Because at least you know, well, look, I'm doing my part to try to make sure if this happens, you know, I'll try to make sure that I'm okay and that my family and loved ones are okay. You know, or, or whatever the concern is. So there's nothing wrong with some of that. And prepping, like I said, can take a basic common sense approach too. Now, do I see more people getting prepared. I think, I would say yes. I think what happened was, let's say, compared to a year and a half ago, the number of people right now, at this minute, that are open, at least, to the possibility of preparing is much higher than, again, it was, say, a year and a half ago. Is the number of people interested in getting prepared higher now than it was one year ago, February of 2020, then I would say no. I would say that the number of people interested was very low up until January of 2020. It began to gradually increase for the first two months of 2020 until it began to peak 
in probably late March and into April and May of 2020, where then some of those ideas began to take root um, in the general public. And that's when you started seeing runs on supplies and stuff in the supermarkets. You remember that, um, where there were lots of just shortages and empty shelves, etc. But then after May or so, I'd say that number dropped off sharply when, you know, society, albeit very differently, continued to function, and, um, and that was that. As a result, I think some people who may be prepared in 2020 now actually look on prepping with distaste, not because of the practical um, concerns. You ask even those people who kind of look at it negatively after doing so themselves. Those same questions that you asked your mother, what would you do if it was all turned off for four days? Um, they would probably have the same answer. You know, it, it would be eye-opening for them too. They're just upset because, you know, mostly I, I'd say for a financial reason, they feel that they maybe got concerned, got panicked and bought the stuff that now they're looking at maybe they didn't really need. And they look maybe bitterly at it as a result. But for all those people, I think that there is also a larger number of people, a number of people who have been exposed to it, and I think see the positives to it as well. And almost because of the pandemic have, uh, it's kind of been eye-opening in that regard, in that regard, to this new uh, world. So I think it has, you know, there is, I'd say, a, uh, you know, a greater interest, I would wager, in getting prepared. I always like Alfred Henry Lewis's uh, quote from 1906, where he said, There are only nine meals between mankind and anarchy. I thought that's a really good one, and uh, I think it certainly rings true. So, Holly, thank you for your question, and uh, likewise, I wish you the very best of luck with your company. I hope it sees great success. And I sincerely wish you the best of luck. So thank you for tuning into the broadcasts. And uh, hopefully reception is good for you as well. And this is just a short comment from an anonymous listener. Listening to your show on Spotify, the talk about paranoia really hit home. I had to drop off university in 2020 because of it, and unfortunately, it hasn't been getting any better. I've been thinking about consulting my GP about sleep pills, as I haven't slept for more than two hours a day for the past week. I get so tired, but the moment I lay my head on the pillow, all I can think of is burglars, murderers, stalkers, uh, noise that isn't there, etc. My mind just goes on this horror movie cycle. I stopped watching TV since I think it might be influencing those thoughts, but it's hard not to hear about bad news when it's all over the place. So thank you for your comment. Uh, but you know, by all means, if the sleep is getting that bad, um, I don't think there's any issue in consulting your general practitioner and seeing what they can do to help. These these things exist for a reason. You have to remember that. Um, I'm sorry. Just you know, remember what I said about the paranoia. But it, I know it's tough. I know that it is. Where sometimes our mind it it races, you know, and it goes crazy when we go to sleep. All these intrusive, unwanted thoughts, they come into your mind. I, I know how that is. You know, I have these troubles sleeping, too. I mean, I just have this awful insomnia. The other week, I really had a real bad bout of it. Um, it was just days of no sleep. I mean, the first... I fell asleep... Uh, I'm just thinking when it was. Where I think I was up for a long time let's say on Wednesday, and I fell asleep. I mean, because my sleep schedule is messed up as is, so you have to remember that. But let's say I fell asleep and woke up on Wednesday at, you know, let's say, I don't know, 8 p.m. Wednesday. I fell asleep then at 12 noon on Thursday. I woke up at 4 p.m. on Thursday, so I only got a four-hour sleep that day. Then from Thursday, at around, you know, 4 p.m., 
I was up for, I would say, over 40 hours. Then I finally fell asleep for like two hours on Saturday, but I had to set my alarm for having to get up to uh, do a YouTube video, or at least I think upload and do the SEO and everything for a YouTube video. So then I woke up, you know, two hours later after having been, you know, awake for like 40 hours. And then after that, I couldn't get back to sleep after I was done. And I was up for another 24 hours until I finally fell asleep, slept for 12 hours, and um, was able to kind of get some regular rest. But I mean, I'll have these bouts of just severe insomnia. To me, it happens for no reason. Um, but I know sometimes these racing thoughts happen when you when you hit the pillow. One thing that I've began experiencing are uh, what they call hypnagogic hallucinations, which uh, I guess those are sort of like closed eye hallucinations. I mean, I get the visual snow, you know, twenty four seven to begin with, and I think from my research there is some crossover between the two. The interesting thing in my case is that they say this is um, often, you know, the experience of the transitional state from wakefulness to sleep. But I mean, sometimes I'll get those and I could open my eyes and I'm awake again and I'm just fine. It's not like I'm really on the threshold of sleep, I don't think. Um, and uh, I get them every single night. Um, one thing that I do sometimes is I just... Whenever, whenever it does happen, I actually, and it's very, very difficult to do, but it's one way that actually is sometimes able to ensure sleep. I just try to not think of anything else, but just watch it, and that helps me fall asleep sometimes. But those things are interesting. Um, you don't usually remember what you see all that often, and I'm sure, I know it's fairly common, but normally it's just like when I close my eyes, I see these incredibly, um, incredibly detailed patterns and shapes and colors, you know, not that I'm on anything, but I just see these incredibly intricate designs and patterns and I'm not, you know, I guess I am generating them, but I'm not thinking of these things. I just see them. It's like something on a projector being uh, shown to me. And they move around. Sometimes it's people, sometimes it's objects. It has no rhyme or reason whatsoever. Like, let's see, sights. Yeah, I get it all. They say, um, yeah, more commonly reported and thoroughly researched. Uh, they could include and manifest as random speckles, lines or geometric patterns, including form constants, um, figurative images, uh, and they can be monochromatic or richly colored, still or moving, flat or three-dimensional. Individual images are typically fleeting and given to very rapid uh, changes. They are said to differ from dreams proper in that hypnagogic imagery is usually static and lacking in narrative content. Yeah, I mean, again, the thing in my case is that I'm not really on the precipice of sleep at this point in time. Again, I'm just kind of laying there, and when I hit the pillow and close my eyes, then I see them, but it still takes me a long time to fall asleep. And then in addition to that, I'm also treated to the uh, auditory component, too. Um, that, um, like the visuals, hypnagogic sounds vary in intensity from faint impressions to loud noises, uh, like knocking and crash and bangs. Uh, snatches of imagined speech are common, while typically nonsensical and fragmented. These speech events can occasionally strike the individual as apt comments or summations of their thoughts at the time. They often contain wordplay, neologisms, and made-up names. Hypnagogic speech may manifest as the subject's own inner voice or as the voices of others, familiar people, or strangers. And I get that too. It's usually two. I get two for the price of one. So when I close my eyes, I see the, um, 
Well, no, not necessarily tesseracts, though I've seen those too, but just the, the shapes and patterns. And then I always hear these conversations, not from anyone that I really, anyone whose voice I recognize, but again, it's just total nonsense and gibberish. And I can never remember what's even being said, but it's just like random words being slapped together. So, I mean, it's just, te it's just textbook, you know, hypnagogic uh, hallucinations and stuff. But at first, when it first started happening, I was really confused by it. But I realized the best way to deal with it is literally just to go with it. So that's exactly what I do. I don't even, um, whenever it happens, usually whenever I'm ready to go to sleep, I just let it go and I just say, all right, I'm just going to immerse myself in it. And uh, that's that. But as weird as, it's, as weird as it sounds, I think they said like one in uh, every 10 people actually deals with it. Though again, the description makes it sound like um, you just get this as like you're completely ready to fall asleep. But in my case, that's not the, um, it's not what happens. It's just interesting either way. The one thing I kind of wish is, um, I wish I was able to remember some of these interesting patterns and, uh, I wish I could just remember that because, boy, that would make such interesting art. You know, psychedelic art, granted, but just so complex, something that I can't, you know, otherwise... I mean, what can you really do? It's like, I don't have the ability or talent to even draw them, so what good is it if I even memorize them all? It's just too complex. It's beyond my ability to draw. But it's just an interesting thing. I've never, I've never shared that before, but it's, you know, a daily experience. But they don't bother me. They've never, they've never bothered me. If anything, they've gotten more complex. I think the first inkling that I ever had of them was maybe in 2018, and it would just be flashes of red and then black. And that was actually just annoying as opposed to anything else. But now there are these very intricate images and imagery and you name it. Uh, it doesn't bother me. It's never distressing. It's totally neutral. It doesn't bother me one bit. So I guess it was just your email when you mentioned like when your head hits the pillow, then I thought about when mine does, and I thought, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Kind of a funny thing to forget about, but <laughs> I just, I'd never brought it up. I thought, oh, I guess I'll talk about it, why not? And on to our last email uh, that I had wanted to get to before now we get to the new emails. These are just ones that I wanted to catch up on. We hear from Natalia in Mexico. He says, I just wanted to share something that I wrote. I am by no means an expert of the sort regarding poetry or writing. It's just a thing that I enjoy doing when my creative juices kick in. These have been difficult times, so I would like to tell everybody who's feeling down, just like I feel sometimes, that they're not alone. I'm with you even if we're hundreds or thousands of kilometers apart. Take care and enjoy life. So this reads as follows, and I apologize if my own poetic reading isn't all the very best, but here we go. I understand nothing but the sharp pain that life inflicts on me. The seconds as bullets when they pass through my body, shaping craters and planes on my skin. I understand nothing but the rivers that flow through my cheeks, for they are born from me. Nurturing the skin that once gave its life to keep the sun above shining every day to eternity. I understand nothing but life, for I am it when no one else is. So I am eternal and finite, just as life should be. Thanks for the great content we're listening. Well, thank you, Natalia, from Mexico. A wonderful poem, and I hope my, my reading of it was adequate. Thank you so much for taking the time to share that. I think it's fantastic, and I hope other listeners out there enjoyed it as well. You're listening to VORW Radio International. All right, so now we're just going to uh, get into some of the newer emails. 
We have a bunch, and I'm just going to try to get into as many as I can. Again, I can't make any guarantees uh, about what I'll be able to get to or won't be able to, but I'll certainly just start working my way through the list, and we will go from there. So with that said, we hear from... Oh, let's just pick one, anyone. And let's just start here with uh, an email from Tim. Hi, Review Bra. I'm a university student studying history and really enjoy your videos, but I'm a particular fan of the podcast. I love the coverage of worldwide topics and contemporary issues. I'd like to know whether you have a particular interest in history, and if so, what is your favorite historical period to learn about? So first, to get to your first question, I do have an interest in history. Um, history is easily my favorite subject, and as I've said before, um, it's more of, you know, people make it feel like it's a curse as opposed to a blessing. They always say, oh, history is the worst one, You're, you know, and it's true, you, you know, you'll never make any money with um, studying that, etc. They make it feel like it's just a waste, but, um, no, history is easily my favorite. My favorite historical period was really from, uh, I'd say, the 1700s up until the mid-1900s. But I, I like it all. You know, I'll go earlier, I'll go later. Um, but it's a something about reading, you know, just reading about the past, hearing about what happened. It's absolutely fascinating to me. So history is, it was always my best subject, always my favorite subject. And um, that's what it comes down to, history and geography. Those two are my favorites. So, um, yeah, those two. <laughs> uh, second question, speaking of two. As a uh, Brit, I'd be interested to know if you've ever visited the UK before. We have a lot of unique and often underappreciated food. I'm sure you'd enjoy reviewing. Thanks and best wishes from Tim. Thank you, Tim. No, I've never been over to the UK. Uh, I've never been overseas. The only countries I've ever been to are, of course, the United States and then Canada. But that's it. I've never been to any other countries, and I've never been to the UK. Maybe one day, once this pandemic is over, and, you know, if they ever decide to make travel a little easier, maybe I'll come over there for a visit. Who knows? So, uh, thank you for the suggestion. It's certainly a country I would like to visit one day, but obviously right now it's a bit complicated. We've got a short email coming in from Jason. Hey, I've been watching your YouTube, and I've been listening to the podcast for a very long time now. Just wanted to tell you I'm a big fan and hope to see you continue throughout the year and stay strong no matter what happens. You make my days better, and I love the personality. Thank you, Jason, for your kind words. It's certainly my intention to uh, keep this going for the, for the rest of the year, and then some. Uh, I have no plans of stopping anytime soon. And uh, if anything, look at the last... Look at how long I've been doing this now. I've been doing this podcast, V-O-R-W, for about seven years now. And I've been doing YouTube for ten years. So considering I've been going that long, I haven't any... I haven't any plans of stopping. There aren't any breaks on this train, as they say. I'm just going to keep pushing forward, no matter what. You know, you have the good times, you have the bad. But I'm going to still be here through it all. And uh, a huge thank you to everyone who has been. We've got a few um, just points that were listed from uh, this listener who goes by Jay. Hope you're staying uh, well and healthy. A few responses to recent topics you've discussed on the podcast. So these are just a few, again, responses to, um, I guess, what I discussed in the last show. Point one. It's so fascinating to hear that you initially became interested in shortwave due to your involvement in a research group. I'd love to hear more details about the questions your group was addressing and the key findings. If you're up for it, I think this would be a great point of discussion to include in a podcast focused entirely on numbers, stations, and related material. Perhaps you could encounter this in a similar approach to what you suggested for another paranormal episode, uh, adding all the shortwave-related emails you get to a folder and dedicating a whole episode to answering them and discussing related info. 
I think your regular listeners would uh, really enjoy an extended discussion dedicated to this. So thanks for the uh, first suggestion. Uh, I agree, I think that's a good one, and that's certainly something that I'll give some uh, some serious thought to. Um, you know, just to... Uh, here's how I first got involved with the numbers stations, and I think a, a whole episode dedicated exclusively to numbers stations is a good idea, and that's something that I'll definitely... I think I will do that going forward, you know? How I first got involved with it... This is just like the little bit of background info, but again, I think I will cover this in much greater detail in an upcoming show. But I first found out about number stations. I think I was just browsing the internet. I don't even remember. It was actually in 2012 when I first found out about number stations. I don't even know what sites I used back then. I have no idea, honestly. I never... I don't know. I don't know how I found it. But... There was one article. Maybe it was on, like, a site like, um... Boing Boing, if anyone heard of that. That used to be pretty big back then. And they would kind of post these weird, like... I don't know, just... Weird types of articles. I imagine it was from that or something. Where they talked about this mysterious radio station in Russia that has been, that, you know, for no known reason has been playing this tone for the last, you know, 30 years or something straight. No one can figure out what it is. Every now and then this mysterious voice gets on the air and reads off numbers in Russian, etc. I thought that was incredibly interesting. Now, before 2012, I still had an interest in radio, but I never listened to shortwave, and I never even knew what it was. Um, but my interest in radio really started back in maybe 2007 or so. With uh, I was very interested in two-way communications. So, you know, walkie-talkies. Um, I had a police scanner, and I would I had a book. I would look up different frequencies. I'd listen to, you know, the police, the fire, the EMS, I'd listen to public transportation, airplanes, you name it, and I'd listen to those two-way communications. And I was also interested in uh, broadcast FM radio, because I had this little MP3 player that had an FM radio in it, and I would scan around and listen to the different stations, and there was this one station that was distant, you know, that was like 50 miles away, but... If I went and I held this little thing in a certain spot, you know, I would be able to get good reception of it, and I would hunt around for that signal sometimes. So, the basics are already there from my interest in radio. Um, But of course, when I found out about this mysterious station, you know, the buzzer, I wanted to listen to it. I wanted to know, how can I listen, and what frequency is it on? And of course, at the time... I had no idea how to even access 4625 kilohertz, which was the buzzer's frequency. It still is. It's still going to this day. So I was looking for an online stream of it because, you know, again, before then, I would listen to lots of stations online. They would all be streaming online. So I thought, well... You know, maybe I could find this uh, station streaming or something, which is really stupid, you know. Why would they set up a stream for it? But who, you know, who cares why I thought that. Um, But sure enough, I did find there was some guy in Ukraine who lived close enough to the station, you know, right uh, right across the border in Russia, that he was in an area where uh, day or night, reception would always be clear. And what he did is he had a shortwave radio tuned to that frequency, and he just set up a live audio feed of his radio. So I tuned into that, and I was able to listen to the buzzer. And I would leave it on for hours sometimes, because, uh, you know, I always wanted to hear a message. And the idea of this mysterious station captivated me. So originally I just used this site. Um through most of 2012. Just this this one website that that's the only station you could ever listen to. But then again, 
I started doing some digging, and I eventually found a link to this web SDR receiver in the Netherlands. Now, a lot of you know what that is at this point, and through a web SDR, it's like an online interactive shortwave radio that you could listen to the entire spectrum. You could listen to anything you want, not just one single station. And I discovered it in 2012, but I had no clue what I was even looking at. It was just way over my head. I had no clue what it was. I thought it was cool, but I couldn't figure out what any of this stuff was, what any of these buttons did. I knew AM, right? That That's, you know, AM, AM radio. But I didn't know what USB, LSB, CW, etc. Uh, is. And after probably a day, I just gave up on the site. I couldn't figure out what I was doing. But at least at the time, I was smart enough to bookmark the page. But again, I was just too confused in 2012 by it, so I just, I, I didn't revisit it. And eventually, the interest in the buzzer kind of subsided, and I had really forgotten about it. Until the summer of 2013, when one day, just out of the blue, I think it was like at 4 a.m., for some reason, I just thought back to that site, that web SDR. I thought, yeah, I forgot about that. Maybe I'm going to try to give it another shot. And I dug through it. I, I had forgotten the link completely. I would never have been able to fa uh, find it had I not have bookmarked it a year ago. But sure enough, I found it. It still worked. And that's when I really sat down and decided to try to learn this site. And I was able to find the buzzer. I was able to listen to it. That just being able to simply do that reignited that interest. And then I started messing around and figuring out what all this other stuff on this site is. And that's when I realized, oh, wow, you can listen to potentially thousands and thousands of different stations. This is like an interactive radio. Whatever it picks up, you have the ability to tune uh, to and listen. And I thought that was the coolest thing. And because AM was the one mode that I was familiar with, I started scanning around. I remember picking up the BBC and some, you know, Russian uh, talk station and some French station, and I thought that was so cool. That's like you're able to listen to the radio in such a raw way um, on your computer like that. So, starting in the summer of 2013, I began learning that site. I began familiarizing myself with it. And I eventually realized that there's a, a chat box on that site. At the time, there were maybe about 100 people that simultaneously used that site. Now it's gone up. Now there's about 600 or so that it could accommodate. But back then, maybe 100. And I noticed that a lot of the people in that chat were very friendly and very knowledgeable. And I went in. I just started asking questions started conversing with the folks there. And eventually, you know, day after day, I kept coming back. And you would see familiar faces. You'd see people with the same usernames there every day. And uh, you knew they were good people, very helpful. And it was like you almost had a group of friends on that site. You know, some, some radio buddies who would be able to help you and talk about whatever they're listening to and, and uh, so on. And I think it was that group of folks on that site at the time... Uh, who really motivated me to keep coming back because there was this nice, you know, community atmosphere there of uh, like-minded individuals who, again, were willing to uh, kind of show me the ropes, so to speak, and weren't annoyed by the fact that I was new. They were very, very helpful. And, um, you know, being able to chat with them about whatever we were listening to really, um, I think, really contributed to my interest. So a lot of them were interested in number stations, and very quickly, because of the amount of time I spent on that site, uh, I, I rapidly accustomed myself to its workings, and realizing that there were other stations that were kind of mysterious and not just this one UVB-76, I started trying to seek out number stations, and very quickly I was able to find them. I think in, like, the first week of even using the site in 2013, I was already able to pick up a few. And it was just so fascinating. And that's when they 
said, well, you know, this chat box is part of this site. We have our own site with our own chat. If you want to uh, take part in that for more of uh, a, you know, in-depth discussion about number stations, I said, sure, you know, uh, just tell me where to go. So that's how I joined that community. And, um, you know, from there, the rest is history, but I'll, I'll be able to talk more about that on, uh, you know, on an upcoming uh, show, maybe just about number stations. But yeah, with shortwave, I mean, my my first interest was number stations and those mysterious, you know, oddities, so to speak. I was really interested in that exclusively from, again, maybe like August of 2013 up until, I'd say, May of 2014. That's not all that I listened to, but that was my primary primary focus. That's why I mostly listened to shortwave to try to catch the numbers stations. But then starting in, again, May of 2014 or so, that's when I began expressing greater interest in the other types of communications, especially international broadcasting. And from that point on, I really started mostly listening to the international broadcasters like the uh, VOA, the BBC, Radio Romania, The Voice of Iran, etc. And number stations now are a secondary focus. So that's what it comes down to. Like, I still listen to number stations for fun, but I mostly spend my time listening to just the uh, the international broadcasters. So anyway, that's just the, uh, the intro there. You know I can get carried away with this stuff. Um, anyway, you have a second point. I know you aren't big on movies, however, given your description of recent movies you've enjoyed, I suggest giving the movie Nightcrawler a watch if you haven't seen it yet. It's something akin to a cross between police chase videos and the movie Joker. Thank you for your suggestion, I'll certainly note that down. And third, as someone who regularly runs the same assays used to sequence COVID strains, I wanted to let you know that the technology behind sequencing is incredibly specific. The results from sequencing between individual strains are widely different, It's so it's incredibly apparent when a different strain has been sequenced. The sequencing technology has been regularly used in labor- laboratories across the world and improved upon since 1977. That being said, the confidence is very high that recent sequencing results are identifying different strains of COVID. So, uh, Jay, thank you. Yeah, that was just an honest quote, because obviously I don't... That's not something that I do, so I wasn't sure about the technology, so thank you for clearing the air about that. And, uh, Jay, thank you for your email. Some very good points. I always appreciate your feedback. All right, going into the next email now, we hear from... Zachary in Las Vegas, Nevada. Good day to you, John. I've been a listener on and off for a while. Really enjoy your show and the YouTube videos. That pizza sandwich melt you did uh, recently was interesting and got me intrigued to try it out. In your recent broadcast, you mentioned the water comparison review you did, and I got a kick out of that because it was the very first video of yours I watched, so it brought back memories. On another note, Your coverage on that police chase was captivating. It felt like a uh, radio station covering it. You'd hear it on an actual radio, if that makes sense. I've started to paint since the lockdowns last year, and I've been happily... and I've happily kept up with it. Eventually, I'll send some fan art your way. I look forward to more and more content from you and wish you all the best. So thank you, Zachary, in Las Vegas. I'm glad you liked the police chase coverage. I remember sitting there watching it, and I had the microphone in hand, and I was thinking to myself, I really don't know how this is even going to go over, but I tried it, and I'm glad. I'm glad it was enjoyable, and uh, that makes me really happy to hear that you took up painting last year, and it wasn't just one of those temporary, you know, little things that we sometimes do to just pass the time, but there's serious uh, commitment to it, uh, it sounds like. So, congratulations, Zachary. Keep, keep it up, you know, keep doing what you like doing, and uh, if you do make any fan art, I'll be more than happy to feature it in the broadcast. So, uh, yeah, keep it up, by all means. Do what you enjoy doing, my friend. All right, our next email comes in from Carlos in California. 
Good morning, evening, or afternoon, Report of the Week. I hope this correspondence finds you well, and I hope you are doing well. I started to watch your YouTube videos about three years ago. I really enjoy your demeanor and the way you review the items on your show, very professionally and witty, unlike any other reviewer on the platform. After a while, I followed you on social media and discovered you did other shows as well, like the music show. I love tuning in and hearing all the diverse music choices and your comments in between them. I even remember sending you requests a few times, and they were indeed played. I then discovered your podcast recently. The first one I listened to was the one with the Polar Express analysis, and I've been an active listener ever since. Out of all the shows you do, the podcast is my absolute favorite. Just hearing you talk about whatever it is that you do and about your hobbies and passions is really inspiring. I enjoy when you talk about your love of shortwave radio and the like. I have a few questions for you, VORW. All right. We have ourselves four questions. Question one. Out of all the shows you make, which show do you enjoy making the most, and which is most profitable? All right. So let's break it down into three uh, categories. Right. We have the YouTube videos that you see on the report of the week. You have the podcasts, which is what you're hearing right now. And then you have the radio shows, which is what goes out on shortwave, where, again, I play the music. I uh, discuss news and uh, all of that. And it's broadcast, again, ex exclusively on shortwave. That's a show that goes out on uh, 5850 kilohertz. Of those three... Uh, which one do I enjoy making the most? I enjoy making the radio show the most by a long shot. Um, it's not even close, the, the comparison. I mean, nothing even comes remotely close within a mile of that. And I know that might be a little strange, considering that here I am doing this podcast, and that's not the favorite thing I enjoy doing, but it isn't. Um, this is easily my second favorite, but my favorite, again, by far, is doing the shortwave broadcast with the music and the random discussion. Then second favorite is doing this podcast. And then least favorite, though still enjoyable, uh, is doing the YouTube videos. Now, which is the most profitable? The YouTube videos and only the YouTube videos. Um, the radio show that I enjoy doing the most is an absolute money pit. You're, you're setting your money on fire doing that. And this podcast breaks even on a good day. And that's all that there is to it. So that's just what it comes down to. And uh, that's the honest truth. One thing that I think I do need to clarify in regards to that question is just because I have a list of, say... Of these three things, what do I enjoy doing the most and what is my least favorite doesn't mean that I hate any of them. It doesn't mean that when I pick up the microphone to do the shortwave broadcasts, I'm sitting there, you know, crying tears of joy every time. And then when I do the podcast, I'm sitting there with this big grin on my face. And then when I do the um, YouTube videos, I'm just dragging myself from one place to the next swearing every step of the way, saying how much I hate it. No, not at all. I enjoy doing all of it, um, but just in terms of that hierarchy, that's just what we have. I would say that in the hypothetical scenario, if let's say I had unlimited wealth and I never needed to worry about cost of living again, the focus of what I do would be very different. And I think I would largely be doing radio stuff on the shortwave, um, what I would probably do is I would um, upgrade the transmitter setup that I currently use, because uh, right now I broadcast, um, I purchase all the airtime, that's why it's so costly, but I would probably purchase airtime from 500 kilowatt transmitters instead of 100 kilowatt, so I would up the uh, transmitting power uh, substantially. So I would broadcast the show again with 500 kilowatts. I would make sure I target every single continent, especially Africa and Asia. And I would probably do the show 
you know, probably two to three hours a day, every single day, seven days a week. And then the videos would just be secondary, and I would just do that whenever I would want to, but that would probably be my biggest focus. Again, if I had unlimited money, this is like a pipe dream if you won the lottery or something, what the focus would be. But I'm very, very thankful that I could even do this stuff to begin with. And it's YouTube, that's the only reason why I'm able to do that. You know, again, like I was saying, um, these two shows, all the audio stuff, um, there's no money here. And that's the one thing. If people ever think to get into radio or podcasting to try to make money, you're going to be mistaken. You know, you can look at the Joe Rogans and stuff, but they are the top 1%. Yes, that could be something that people could aspire to, but don't think that if you start something, that's how it's going to be. And I know that might not be the best thing to say, but that's just the way that this medium is. I just do these two shows because I really like doing it, I'm passionate about it, and uh, that's what it comes down to. But it's a nice balance, I enjoy what I do, that's what we have there. Um, Alright, question two. What are the scheduled times for the music show and your podcasts? I usually miss your music programming, and I can't remember what time it usually starts. Um, The music show goes out three times a week, so there's three new shows each and every week. It goes out, since you're in California, at the time of 6 p.m. Pacific, that's 9 p.m. Eastern, every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday evening. There's a new show every night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday evening at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, on the shortwave frequency of 5850 kilohertz, that's 5.850 megahertz. 5850 kilohertz, 5.850 megahertz. Um, there's no tune-in stream for that, but it still gets out to a lot of folks, and I'm, I'm very happy with its reach. As for the um, podcasts, there is no schedule, but I try to aim for maybe one every two weeks or so, but there is no schedule for the podcast. It just is out whenever it is. Now, your third question, you said, what made you think about doing your first YouTube episode, first music show, and first podcast? Since we already discussed the um, anniversary at the beginning, I'll just I'll skip the first YouTube one. But the first music show and first podcast. So the first podcast I ever did, VORW, was... You know what? Let's actually just check. Now, my, my typing here is going to be a bit a bit messy because I'm using only one hand because I've got the microphone in the other. But let's figure this out. Let's go to... because I have them all in a playlist. I just want to know when my first VORW show even was. No, not that one. I clicked on the wrong playlist. I don't want to watch the Shamrock Shake review. I've seen that thing so many times at this point. I don't want to look at that again. VORW shows and podcasts. All right. I'm just looking for a date here. When I did my first VORW show. That'll just help. Here we go. The first VORW show I ever did was on March 25th, 2014. I first started doing the VORW podcasts because this all stems into my radio listening. Um, It was around that time where I first started listening to some of the international broadcasters a little more. Really, that began peaking in May, but already I was starting to. And uh, I I really liked what I heard. I enjoyed these long-form talk broadcasts, and I wanted to do something similar. So that's what really gave me the motivation to do that. I had the recording resources. It wasn't anything fancy, but I was able to do it. And, um... I picked out the name VORW because uh, it's an acronym. It stands for Voice of the Report of the Week, VORW. And I kind of got that name from, you know, lots of the um, international shortwave broadcasters that also used Voice of in their name. Um, You know, Voice of America, Voice of Greece, Voice of Russia... Voice of Turkey, Voice of the Islamic Republic of Iran, etc. So that's where I got that name from. And I just stuck with it ever since. 
so that's what motivated me to do the first, um, you know, the first talk show. The first music show came about a year later, in early 2015. Uh, the reason why I started doing those, again, very similar to, you know, all this stems from the exact same thing, listening to the shortwave. At that point, I started listening to a lot of music programming on the shortwave. I thought to myself it would be a lot of fun if I were able to balance out the show uh, with some music, but unfortunately, you know, I can't really do that online because you'll get dinged for copyright. But on the shortwave, the legalities are a bit different, and all the stations you buy the airtime from have blanket licenses to begin with, either way, and uh, you're able to do it there. So I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to give this a shot. Another thing that was really prohibitive at the time was costs. I couldn't really afford any of the airtime, but I was finally able to get a deal, and I was able to get on the air, and, um, you know, once I started, I never wanted to to go back. It was so much fun having the show physically transmitted over the shortwaves. And, um, hey, here we are. Here we are, six years later, still doing it. So that's just what motivated me to do that. So thank you for your question. Again, I can go on and on, but hey, that's just what we have there. And, well, question four, I'm not going to get into this on the air. Um, but I will respond to you in writing about that. So thank you, Carlos, in California. All right, let's go to the next one. What's uh, another one? All right, Ben in Reading, England. Hi, Ben. I, I remember you. You're a regular. Good to hear from you again. That's, that wasn't part of the email. That was just me saying that. Um, anyway, you say, uh, I hope you're doing well. I'll get right to it. You mentioned in your most recent VORW podcast that in the early days of your channel, say around 200 subscribers, you really got to know a lot of these subscribers by name as they formed a small community around your channel. My question is, do you know if any of those fans of yours from the early days are still watching or listening now? I know there's a great community of fans who write into your shows regularly, but I just wondered uh, if you ever hear from those who are watching uh, watching you way back when you started out. Thanks for taking the time to read this email, and I wanted to say congratulations on the upcoming 10-year anniversary of your channel on the 20th. It's a huge milestone, and every new video or podcast you make brightens up my day more than you know. Best wishes from Ben. All right, Ben, thank you for your question. Yeah, I you know, I remember my early community, and exactly as you said, um, it was on the smaller side. There were about 200 subscribers in the first two years. And granted, and we know this with YouTube, not every subscriber really watches the videos. So there were really, you know, a couple dozen active people at most. Um, but I got to know them. I got to interact in the comments. And I still remember the names and faces to this day. Unfortunately, I don't think any of them still watch uh, the channel anymore. Or if they do, they've kind of just been lost in the sea of, of uh, faces, so to speak. But I think the last time I ever heard from anyone who was part of that original group was about maybe a year and a half ago or so. And uh, that's it, which is still very impressive. Now, I don't expect anyone to watch or listen to anything that I say or do um, more than a second longer than they currently are. So the fact that someone actually stuck around for nine years is incredible. Um, that's not to say that all of them did. I remember already getting into 20... See, because it started getting difficult to keep track of this. Because in 2013 and for 2014, and eventually ceasing in mid-2015, uh, I had the comments disabled on every single video across the entire channel. Um, the only way you could ever get in touch with me back then for about two years was if you messaged me on YouTube, because back then they had a messaging service, or emailed me. And I didn't use the email much, so really just to, um, you know, to message me on YouTube. The reason why I had comments blocked for so long 
was because during that time, especially in 2013 and 2014, uh, I was just receiving so much hate that I just, I didn't want to deal with it anymore. So I blocked the comments, and that was one way to stop it at least, but it just needed to be done for my own mental well-being. So during those two years, I don't know how many of the original crew, so to speak, still watched the uh, content. I know that after 2015, there was still a percentage, so maybe like, all right, let's just say there were, for the sake of this example, 40 regular viewers before 2013. I would say that after 2015, maybe about 10 of those 40 um, were still around that, that I remember. Over the years, of course, that number began to, you know, go down a bit. And by 2017, let me just think right now, one, two, three, I'd say maybe three or four of that original group still left. One of them I remember last commented in 2018, another one right around the same time. So two of them, the last time I saw them was 2018. The last two, one of them was in Missouri, and one of the reasons why I heard from him a lot longer was because he had a shortwave radio. Yeah, I didn't. He was into shortwave before I ever said anything about it, so he he had picked up some of my shortwave broadcasts from time to time, and uh, as a result, you know the correspondence with him certainly extended much longer than other cases. So the last time I heard from him was probably maybe 2019 or so. Um, you know, through a reception report uh, for the shortwave broadcast. And then the last listener or viewer from the original channel that I ever heard from was uh, someone in Texas, and I think that was about a year ago through an email. Now, I don't know how many folks are still around from that era. There might be people just lurking around. There might be some that check back here and there, but um, the last I know definitively was about a year ago. So that's where that stands. I hope people don't find that uh, creepy or anything. I just I just remember the names and faces, and uh, that's what it comes down to. You know, but however long people really watch or listen for, it doesn't, you know, it is what it is. The only thing that ever perplexes me, and I guess it's just how people are, is uh, sometimes you'll get people that will say things that they obviously don't mean. And I don't think there's any, you know, malice behind it. I think maybe it's just, I don't know, one's understanding of the English language or something that they think it's a nice thing to say, um, but really it can be misconstrued, is uh, sometimes people will say, oh, you know, <laughs> you've got a... Um... Now, some people do mean it. I, I shouldn't laugh at this. I just sometimes see these... There's one example that I'm thinking of right now that cracks me up. And I'm, just, I'm not laughing at anyone who says this. I'm just thinking of the absurdity of a situation. Um, but you'll get people who will write in um, more often than you think, and, and they'll say, you know, I, I, I like what you do, and, um, you know, you've got, you've got a permanent listener here. You've got a a loyal regular viewer here, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch you till the end, or something like that, implying that they're gonna be around a while. And I just kind of laugh, because a lot of the times when people say that, it's not, it's not literally meant, of course, it's not meant, it's just another way of saying, I like what you do, keep it up. But sometimes it, it gives the implication that, oh, you know, I'll be around for a while. And obviously that never happens. Um, most of the time when people say that, you never hear from them again afterward. And again, I don't blame people for doing that. I don't expect anyone to be around for any longer than they are. That's completely fine. But the thing that made me laugh is I remember one instance, there was someone, I think it was in Utah or something, who had that, um, an email again like that and had a question about shortwave, I think, I don't know what it was, wanted to get a radio, and I think she was thinking of, like, an older radio or something, and had a question. And my, my email was a bit full at that point, so I had to... It took me about a week to get back to that email, but finally I worked my way through it. I 
got a response. I sent some radio recommendations and a word of thanks um, in return. And <laughs> the response was bewildering to me. Uh, the, the person says, you know, you know, could you please, uh, could, you, could you never email me again? Um, F off and leave me alone. I sent this a week ago, etc. I thought to myself, whoa, you know, that's, that's, uh, boy, that's real, uh, a real change of heart right there, I have to say. You know, one email you say, oh, I'm gonna be, I'm, I think the person even said I'll be watching this for life or something. And, uh, then a week later, that's what they say. So I thought to myself, well, you know, you do you. You do you, I'll do me, and that's all there is to it. So that was that. But it, it made me laugh. And I'll never forget that, because it's just kind of, it's so funny when people sometimes say these things, obviously in that case they didn't mean it. And in that instance, it still perplexes me, like, why would the person even be, why would they want to waste the money on a radio in that case when they were so abrasive just one week later? It makes zero sense to me. People are weird, that's, all, that's, that's my only explanation and possible answer. People are weird sometimes, that's all I can say. But, you know, some people, again, they say these things like in that example, and obviously they don't mean them, but there are instances where people have been here uh, for many years. Like, again, I know 2014, that's not as long as 2011, but I know that there are a lot of active and regular listeners, uh, even to this show, who have still been around since 2014. And in that case, I would say definitely in the hundreds, maybe thousands of folks, again, who have been here since 2014. Obviously, you know, they're still around. That's fantastic. Um, you have some shortwave listeners out there, a good community, who have been listening to my shortwave broadcasts to North America. And uh, they correspond uh, regularly almost in every single broadcast that I do some of whom have been doing that for every single show for like the last two years or so. And that doesn't bother me one bit. It's fantastic. You get to, you know, you get to know a good crew of regular, uh, of regular listeners and correspondents. So I think some people say things and they mean them and other people just say it, you know, just again, as like, I don't know, a choice of words. It, it, it's, the meaning is not literal. But no matter what, no matter how long you've been here, I'm very thankful that you're here right now, taking the time out of your day or night to uh, listen to this broadcast. So I hope you all know I'm very, very thankful for all of your, uh, all of your, your viewership and listenership and support. And like I said earlier in the show, and I mean it sincerely, if it weren't for you, if it weren't for all of you, uh, this this wouldn't be here for ten years. I will tell you that most definitely. So thank you. All right, this next email comes in from. No name was given here. <laughs> Though looking at the uh, the picture there, I don't I don't think you are the famous drummer, but <laughs> wouldn't that be something? Either way, um, you say from Antarctica. Hi John, how are you? Hope you're nice and warm because over here it's freezing. I wanted to write in today because I want to know if you believe in the story that a plane did not land for 37 years. I want to hear what you believe. Thank you. Good day to you and your viewers. Well, thank you for writing in. And uh, for your question, um, as I got to the email, I at first I was lost. I didn't know what um, what was being talked about, but uh, I believe this is in reference to Pan Am Flight uh, 914. And I remember reading about that somewhere here and there, but I really hadn't known about it in, in at least great detail. But no, I don't believe that uh, in that case. I think there are a lot of unexplained things in this world of ours, and of course, as those of you regular listeners know, I am more impartial um, toward cryptids, toward strange beasts and creatures and uh, aliens, and I'm always willing to lend an ear at least to conspiracies and just take an honest look at it. Uh, I really enjoy that stuff, um, but in this instance, um, no, this was not real, it was fake, and I'll tell you why. Um, so what it was is they, they claimed that there was Pan Am Flight 914 that disappeared in 1955, and then 37 years later, I guess in the early 90s that'd be, 
and it suddenly reappeared and landed in Miami, Florida, as if nothing had happened. Um, various solutions had been offered to explain the riddle of Pan Am Flight 914, the most popular of which would be uh, that the plane flew through some sort of time travel portal. But, unfortunately, that never happened. The reason being is if you do a little bit of digging, and you see, well, where did the story of uh, Pan Am Flight 914 originate? And you do a little bit of digging. Now, the site Snopes, I don't particularly like all that much. I think sometimes it's just they... You know, it is what it is, but sometimes they forget, they skim over certain details or whatever. Um, but in this instance, because I'm just familiar with the publication that they cite, it's certainly credible in this instance, where this story originated in a publication called The Weekly World News. Now, those of you who are familiar with The Weekly World News, you understand why I'm saying that. For those of you who don't, uh, you know, you might be saying, well, the Weekly World News, I mean, the name of that publication sounds reputable, so what's, uh, what's the big deal? The Weekly World News, I don't think it exists anymore in print, but it was a, a tabloid newspaper, and magazine, I think, that intentionally published just like some of the most um, laughably bizarre stories, and all of the things that it really published were just fiction. It was just for, for a joke. Like, if I search, I think it's still online. Yeah, it was a tabloid, um, which published mostly fictional news stories in the United States from 1979 to 2007. It was renowned for its outlandish cover stories, often based on supernatural or paranormal themes, and an approach to news that verged on the satirical. Yeah, like, the stories that they have are still, are still around, but, like, these are some of their, their stories right now. Um, <laughs> this is on the, the front page of their website. Uh, Alien lands in Vermont, gets too fat to fly home. 103-year-old quarantiner emerges in 2021. He went into hiding during the Spanish flu of 1918 and unfortunately chose the wrong time to rejoin humanity. The uh, Yeti is behind cryptocurrency. The article says, much, uh, much to the shock of the financial world, it has been discovered the Yeti are behind the current explosion in cryptocurrencies. Jeffrey Ness is the current head of the Federal Reserve Board. He noted, it's shocking. It's really putting the crypto into cryptocurrency. We had no idea. However, it's not illegal for the Yeti to have been involved. They'd better make sure they pay their taxes in Nepal on all the transactions, though. And, you know, it's a stories like that that are obviously um, completely false. And again, they verge on satire at this point. But I, I always enjoyed the Weekly World News. And before they went out of print, um, I bought a couple copies. And uh, then I subscribed to their online newsletter and would get um, some of their stories forwarded to me online. And then there's another tabloid that, again, doesn't exist uh, called The Sun. Now, over in the UK, I know there is a tabloid that I think still exists called The Sun, but this is a different one. There is one in the US called The Sun also, which is very similar to the Weekly World News in that they publish just these fantastical stories. That, it was just laughable, but it was funny. That's why I would get it. It's, it's entertainment. So as a result, considering that this story first emerged from the Weekly World News, um, it's obviously not true. And uh, also, I think the idea for that probably came from the Twilight Zone episode from uh, 61, the uh, Odyssey of Flight 33, which I think shares a very similar plot. So uh, no, it is not. I don't believe that for a second. Like I said, some strange occurrences um, hold more water than others, and some are certainly more credible, but this is one of the ones that I just take a hard pass on, and I don't think that really happened. One example, and I'm sorry if any people um, consider this example tasteless, but you just, just, just picture this for a, a moment, right? Imagine 
because this is a tragedy and I don't want to talk about it the wrong way, but just for the sake of this example, remember in 2014, um, flight MH370, right? This plane that disappeared without a trace. And now uh, many obviously feel that, I mean, personally, like with MH370, I think the pilot, um, I, I believe the theory where the pilot probably killed himself. So he, you know, locked everyone out of the cockpit, turned the pressure down, and uh, then he was the only person alive and just flew the plane with everyone else dead inside over the uh, Indian Ocean until it probably ran out of fuel and crashed. That's my guess, but I might be wrong. That's just what I think happened. But if MH370, because I still don't think they ever really found it, just pieces of wreckage here and there, but if MH370 suddenly appeared today and landed at its destination, uh, which was Beijing, China, like nothing had happened, that would be the biggest news story it would be it would be front page news at least for weeks and weeks and weeks if not longer probably the biggest uh, news story of the year because of the unexplainable nature of it and the fact that it's something that isn't supposed to happen uh, if that if that happened for instance in that case everyone would have heard about it so you have to think then if a plane was in the air for 37 years and it suddenly reappeared you know, something that would have so blatantly defied the laws of physics, etc. If it really happened, it wouldn't be one of those stories where you would have to ask if this really did happen or not, um, because it would be just common knowledge that it did. So the fact that we have to ask this question about it um, thus kind of gives us the answer that that didn't really happen. But it's, it's interesting to think about either way. And uh, that's what we have there. But last night, actually, I was revisiting um, some strange disappearances. I was reading about that in my free time. I was reading about this one. But now I'm not going to share it on, on air. It's too graphic. don't want to get the show completely dinged or anything. But it's just strange, you know, strange circumstances that it makes you wonder what happened to these people. You know, it's just... This individual, where they found her body, what was done to it, how it was moved, etc. The circumstances, it's just really, really weird. You know, it's... Maybe there's an explanation, but even if you try to be rational about it, it doesn't make much sense. When you try to answer it logically. So, I was reading about that, then I was reading about this one cryptid story that... Whether it was true or not, I thought it was creepy about some sort of creature that someone thought they saw in the subway tunnels or something. I thought it was interesting. And again, just spooky regardless of, it, of its legitimacy. So, I enjoyed this stuff, but thanks for raising the, uh, raising the topic. Alright, this next email comes in from Hannah, who says, Hi John, I was recently introduced to your YouTube channel and subsequently your podcast. From listening to the podcast... I know you like to hear what platform your listeners use. I use the Apple Podcast app. Discovering your content has been a bright spot in this pandemic, and I appreciate the breath of fresh air you provide to so many people. Your hard work and dedication is undeniable. All I can say is thank you. As for my question, I was wondering if there is a website which had all the different broadcasters and the programs uh, they have at, at what times for shortwave. If you've answered this question before, hopefully it's not too big of a pain to answer again. You have introduced me to a whole new world of shortwave radio. So uh, thank you for your question, Hannah, and um, I'll certainly uh, be able to answer it here. Uh, number one, the good news is that there is a site uh, that I will I will send you in writing. So I'll reply to your email in writing, and there is a site. It's a little tough to understand at first, but like with many things in the medium of shortwave, you get used to it pretty quickly. Uh, the website name is shortwave.info, that's short-wave.info, short-wave.info, short -dash 
wave.info and uh, you go there and the first thing you see is like this chart at the top then you see a world map and then another chart at the bottom uh, this is probably the most comprehensive resource you'll ever find for what stations you can find so for instance if you first go to the site you'll see at the very top it says find frequencies for and then it's automatically at BBC in English but you can change the station, the language, the time, anything. It'll just tell you what's on the air. Um, the one thing you just have to just familiarize yourself with a little bit is UTC time. But that can be very easy in terms of uh, just Googling it. And you'll be able to do the conversions real quick. Like I have UTC memorized at this point. But it's one of those, one of those things that you'll get the hang of it. But the chart below, um, you'll see on the leftmost side, it has frequency. Then it lists what the station is. So it just says the frequency. Let's say um, this one, you know, 6195 kilohertz. Then in the next column, it says BBC. So you know that the BBC is on 6195 kilohertz. Then it says start and end. So in this case, it says that the BBC is on 61.95 between 10 and 12 UTC. In days, it says 1 through 7, so that means that it's on that frequency at that time every day of the week. Language in English, so you know that it's on that frequency at English. Then the next column says PWR, that means power. So it's transmitted uh, with 125 kilowatts. So it's in kilowatts, so 125 means 125 thousand watts, again 125 kilowatts. AZ means the azimuth, which you don't really need to pay attention to that one. I mean, you can if you want, but that just says the angle that the antenna is beamed. Uh, then the transmitter site, it says Cranji, which is uh, in Singapore. You know, you'll see the flag next to it. That's the flag of Singapore. And then remarks, it'll tell you how strong the signal should probably be. Um, that's just an explanation of what this chart exactly is, and it's just applied to every station on the whole shortwave spectrum. But really, just familiarize yourself with um, the UTC time. It looks complicated, but it's pretty easy to navigate. One thing you'll notice on the map, probably somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, or, or somewhere, maybe the South Atlantic, you see a little red uh, dot. What you can do there is you can click on that red dot and drag it on the map to around where your location is. So as a result, um, then for the remarks, it'll tell you how strong the broadcast should be at your location. The uh, broadcasts shaded in red are the ones that are currently on the air. And again, the site can be changed by the minute. If you go up to the very top, now that we know what that chart is, and again, this is something that'll take a while to fully learn, but you can uh, click on where it says BBC, there'll be a drop-down menu, and you'll see all sorts of stations now. Um, Adventist World Radio, All India Radio, um, iRadio, Radio New Zealand, um, Radio Nikkei, etc. These aren't all the stations, just a few, but for instance, let's click... Uh, Radio Slovakia International. Then you can click the next tab that says Language. So let's say I want to see, um, does Radio Slovakia International broadcast in French? I'll click French. Then for the time, right now it says Now, but I'm going to unclick that, and I'll just click Go. And I think this is just a good thing you can do if you have the site up. You could just listen to this guide at the same time. And now you'll see, oh yeah, Radio Slovakia International um, does broadcast in French uh, four times a day. You know, again, um, exactly the same what we saw the last time. Frequency 3985, station Radio Slovakia International. Um, this one begins at 1630 and ends at 1700 UTC, so it's a half hour broadcast. Seven days a week, it's in French. Broadcast with one kilowatt with a non-directional antenna from a transmitter site in Kahl, uh, Germany. 
So that means that that broadcast was really just for Central Europe. All right, now what happens, let's say, does, does Radio Slovakia broadcast in Swahili? Let's search. Nothing comes up. It just says your search returned no valid results. Radio Slovakia, they don't have a Swahili service, so they only broadcast in uh, a couple languages. Below that, you'll also notice a little box that says Find Stations Broadcasting On, and um, this you can just search by frequency. So again, uh, let's say 4625 kilohertz. That's the frequency of the buzzer. Hit now, nothing comes up. All right, let's type in 5850 kilohertz. That's my frequency. You'll see there's a bunch of uh, programs, but you scroll down, eventually you do see, oh yeah, there's VORW. Yeah, 5850, VORW Radio International, 0200 to 0300 UTC, that's 9 to 10 Eastern, every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in English, 100 kilowatts, uh, 315 degrees from Okeechobee, Florida, United States. So that's where my broadcast comes up on the site. And then finally, and this requires a more in-depth understanding of the shortwave broadcast, but like I said, this is such an extensive resource. If you just want to hear, it doesn't just need to be by the, by the um, you know, frequency or particular stations. So back in the tab where you can select the specific station, at the very top you can just click any station, and then let's go down to, yeah, how about, how about Indonesian? So any station in Indonesian, we click go, and all of a sudden, all right, there's a list of 34 broadcasts. So these are all the broadcasts in uh, Indonesian that we can find. So let's see, there's RRI, Radio Republic of Indonesia, uh, on a few frequencies for uh, listeners domestically in Indonesia. Uh, we have the voice of Indonesia. NHK World Japan, KBS World Radio, Radio Taiwan, Voice of Vietnam, China Radio International, um, Radio Saudi International, etc. Uh, so these are all the broadcasts that transmit in Indonesian that, you know, just through common logic, you'd have to assume all of them target uh, Indonesia primarily, where there still is a number of uh, shortwave listeners. And again, you can reverse that. You can say, all right, let's just see what the uh, Voice of America broadcasts in. So I'll scroll down on the menu to Voice of America. And now I'll just select a button that says any language. Let's find out what you can hear the VOA in. And it shows that, okay, the VOA has an extensive network um, of 225 broadcasts a day. And uh, they broadcast in a lot of languages. Let's see, English, uh, Shona, Hausa, French, Khmer, Tibetan, Korean, Kurundi, uh, Burmese, Amharic, Somali, etc. And you can just scroll down that list. And again, then looking at this list of the 225 broadcasts, you see there's about, about 10 that are currently shaded in red. Those are the ones that are on uh, on the air right now. So we've got the uh, Amharic service of the VOA transmitted from Wooferton, uh, England, with about 300 kilowatts. So that's beamed to the Horn of Africa, of course, Ethiopia. We've got um, the VOA in English from Thailand with 250 kilowatts. That's probably to South Asia. Um, another broadcast in Amharic, transmitted from the UAE, again to Ethiopia. Uh, the VOA in Portuguese from Botswana, transmitted well, for a couple, a couple areas. Probably Angola, Mozambique, and then uh, Brazil. Could kind of hit all of those in a straight line. And, uh, you know, so on and so forth. The VOA in Portuguese transmitted from Greenville, North Carolina with 250 kilowatts. Again, probably for those areas, you know, Brazil and then Southern Africa. So yes, I would highly recommend this site. It's a bit confusing, but what I would recommend doing is um, when you open up the site, just revisit this discussion. And then as you're going through it, you can kind of listen to what I'm saying to try to get the hang of it. 
But again, the most confusing thing is the UTC time. But once you get the hang of it, and you can just Google it, you can find out what time that is and what it converts to. And also just look at the ones shaded in red. Those are the ones you can hear right now. And uh, it should help. But this is by far, I mean, the most detailed, the most comprehensive resource for shortwave schedules you could ever imagine. It pretty much tells you everything that broadcasts on the entire medium. So it's, um, it's such an invaluable resource. I really recommend you use it, short-wave.info. And again, if you change the, um, the green dot or the red dot, you move it to your location, um, the signal strength, that's, you know, it's pretty accurate. So with the VOA, for instance, it says to me that the English broadcast from Botswana uh, on 15.580 kilohertz should be strongest for me. And I know that is accurate. I was listening to that broadcast yesterday afternoon, and uh, it did make it over here. Whereas the weakest ones are uh, two transmissions from Sao Tome in uh, Shona, again, I think beamed towards Southern Africa, Central Southern Africa. And uh, that makes sense. You know, the, the antennas at that site in Sao Tome are beamed in a certain way that it just never really propagates to North America at all. So it's a good, it's a good site. It'll take some playing around, but um, it's such a fantastic resource. So I really recommend to use it. Um, as I recommend anyone else interested in shortwave as well. As I said, it's that is the most comprehensive site I have ever found. And I use it to this day. Huh. Oh, speaking of uh, shortwave, I just got a new reception report. I guess it came in eight minutes ago. So since we're on the email here, let's see what it is. Throughout the week, I sometimes get shortwave reception reports sent in for broadcasts and uh, they kind of trickle in most of the time they mostly come in when i'm live on the air but other ones you know again come in later on oh and before i get into this hannah again thank you for uh, writing i appreciate your email and kind words um but let's see this one says vorw signal report from western texas and uh, let's see this is the first time i'm seeing it this is the first time I heard your show. I enjoyed the musical selections. By the way, I'm a YouTuber as well, though I've never been successful enough to make it my full-time job, but I'll be sure to check out the videos. Your signal was strong with a little bit of fading every five to seven minutes, which is uh, typical uh, for this wavelength during the wee hours. A uh, full report is included below. Cheers. So let's see. Tuned in on February 16th from 2 to 3 a.m. Central Time on 7730 kilohertz a.m. mode. All right, S9 plus 20. That means you got a strong signal, again, with a little bit of fading. All right, very good. Very good. Good to know someone out there, even late at night, was uh, tuned in over there in West uh, Texas on the shortwave, 7730 kilohertz. So, very good. So... That email, of course, I'll be sure to get back to in writing, because he probably just listens on the radio at this time anyway. So I'll get back, I'll send him a word of thanks, and probably a uh, broadcast schedule, because I know that airing of mine is mostly beamed to the Pacific, but the signal is obviously still good in all points in between. So I'll send him a link to my main broadcast a schedule anyway that he could tune to a bit at a bit more of a reasonable hour at 8 p.m. on 58.50. All right, we've got WH checking in, longtime listener slash viewer. From what I've gathered out of your show and podcast, I'd like you to cons I'd like to consider us uh, kindred spirits and similar in many of our thought processes slash outlooks on, light, on life. I know you try to remain politically unbiased as possible, as do I, so I wanted to pose a question for your podcast for you to discuss. Do you believe government, regardless of whether it's an autocracy, aristocracy, or democracy, has had an overall positive or negative effect on the human psyche over the course of modern history? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic, considering your neutrality, and I wish you all the best moving forward. 
cordially, WH. So thank you, WH, for your question. My view, I would say overall, and that's having to consider everything. I would say that overall, um, a slightly, slightly positive effect on the human psyche over the course of modern history. You have bad governments out there, and even right now, you know, I can't help but have criticisms of uh, governments. You know, sometimes you feel like they do too much, that they overreach, and other times you feel like they do too little, where they seem to always make the wrong choice, or they just do things that make you want to rip your hair out. You know, I have that problem regardless of who's in power or what party. I have that, you know, it's just, you have these frustrations. But regardless of all of that, I think, at least how I feel about humanity, you need to have some sort of government. You need to have someone in charge. You need to have some sort of degree of organization. You need to have laws and the enforcement of those laws in order to have a safe, functional, and productive society. I say that because even though most people, I think, may be inclined to behave themselves within reason, you do have a number of folks who can do absolutely horrible things, and there needs to be someone out there to stop that. You know, if there was no government, you know, you could have people that just go out and kill each other all the time and do it for no reason. You shouldn't have that. Um, there does need to be a degree of organization to keep those sorts of folks in check and try to have accountability, you know, toward their actions to show that actions have consequences. Now, these days, I have lots of problems with the way that it is right now. Uh, sometimes I think, you know, in regards to that order and in terms of accountability, etc., sometimes I feel like they either go after the wrong people, they they have agendas that, of course, conflict with my, my own view of the world. You know, they have ulterior motives, or again, they go after the wrong person, or, you know, they let the slimiest scum weasel their way out of it, as they always do. And in many cases, I don't like what I see, but at the same time, I still believe that something is better than nothing. I would rather have a government, inept it might be at times, and just try to make the best of it, as opposed to no government at all. Because with no government, I mean, while you might be free to do what you want, so are other people, and it doesn't mean that we'll be able to live harmoniously and respect each other's boundaries, and, um, you know, treat each other well with uh, respect, dignity, and, and kindness. You know, we could all have our little slice of land, so to speak, if there's no government, and, all right, you know, I can do whatever I want on this land, and you can do whatever you want on your land, but then someone might say, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to go over and, uh, and kill that little SOB today, and no one's going to tell that person that they can't. Of course they can. And, well, it doesn't look like it's going to be a good day for me if that happens. So, that's the thing. I just think that there still needs to be rules, because while a lot of people can behave themselves, there are folks that can't or won't, and I firmly believe in the ideology that actions should have consequences. Doesn't mean that I'm overly draconian, but I just know that even a small number of people can utterly ruin, destroy or, you know, in some instances, completely end the lives of others who never deserved any of that. So, this is one reason why. Again, as you could tell, I have my grievances. I don't like the way some things are right now, but I'll still take that over nothing at all. So, thank you for your question. I thought it was a real good one from WH. Thank you. Thank you for writing in. Uh, we'll go with this one, which is more or less a comment. It's from Chiara in Italy. Hi, Review Bra. Sorry for the grammar mistakes, um, but understand I'm not a native English speaker. I've been watching your YouTube reviews and podcast on Spotify since last September, and I've never regretted it once. I love how you keep doing things you like to do and want to do, like listening to shortwave radio and wearing suits, 
without caring about other people's opinions. I've started playing the piano since uh, September of 2019. I was 19 years old, and it was a very hard decision because a lot of people say it's better to start an instrument when we're young, but thanks to my rough childhood, that was impossible. After lots of arguing with my relatives, it was the best decision of my life. I never imagined doing something I wanted was going to be so hard, especially when convincing my close relatives, but I just wanted to say thank you for giving me strength to keep doing the things I want to do, even if I have to go against my family and friends. I love your content and never change. So thank you, Chiara, in Italy. And, uh, well, thank you for your kind words. That means a lot to me. And, uh, it, it really touches me to know that, you know, these broadcasts and videos and, and publications of mine kind of gave you the motivation to do what you want to do, you know, to take up piano playing. And I'm glad that it worked out to be such a, such a fantastic decision. I know taking that first step sometimes and trying to have those conversations and get those foundations metaphorically built, that can be the hardest part. But once you do that, you realize, oh, wow, you know, I really wanted to do this. And uh, I imagine you're really glad you did, so thank you. Keep it up, and uh, by all means, keep doing what you love doing. So thank you, Chiara, in Italy, for your kind words. All right, so we'll try to uh, get to a few more emails. Again, I try to get to whatever I can in this broadcast, but I can't make any guarantees. Again, you're listening in to VORW International. Our next email comes in uh, really as a comment from Ryan in Utah. Dear John, I wrote to you nearly a year ago as a fairly new airline pilot watching the industry's dramatic reaction to COVID-19, and I was sure I'd be losing my job imminently. I'm happy to say that my airline hasn't furloughed a single pilot and that my schedule has picked up to a somewhat normal pace, though the same can't be said for many of my brothers and sisters at other companies. I wanted to tell you about a little-known aspect of being a pilot, both professionally and recreationally. We're scared to death to seek any medical treatment, physical or mental, and it's because of the FAA. We all have to pass periodic physical exams, which is all well and good, but the nature of the FAA's draconian reporting requirements dictate that we must report all health care visits, and many require explanations which may defer or disqualify our medical certificates, thereby costing us our jobs. Any mental health treatment may result in us losing our ability to work. Also, we are incentivized to let suspected serious conditions go undiagnosed and untreated because such things may result in the hasty revocation of our medical certificates. As a result, pilots do not seek treatment for serious health issues, and that results in unhealthy pilots lying about their conditions or covering them up. Pilots suffer disproportionately from mental health issues and heart disease, and it's a direct result of the FAA's rules, which don't encourage treatment and wellness, and only expect us to be superhuman. Suicides and heart attacks, which could have been prevented, are regrettably too common. Thankfully, I haven't had to push any of my own serious issues aside, but I'd be lying if I hadn't had bouts of moderate depression or anxiety, as so many people do. I'd love to see a therapist, but any medication prescribed would risk voiding my medical certificate. We can't keep pushing pilots to avoid treatment. It's a huge risk for us and for the traveling public. Thank you for listening to my concerns, and I love your radio show. I hope you're doing well, and please know you're a comforting presence to so many of your listeners, from Ryan in Utah. So thank you, Ryan, for your email. And I must say, number one, uh, that I certainly do remember you. I remember your, uh, I remember your emails around the, I guess as the COVID pandemic was starting to ramp up, and I remember uh, hearing your perspective as an airline pilot, and I thought it was quite interesting. I know there are a few airline pilots that do listen to this broadcast, and, uh, and see, this is something that I never knew, and it's really sad to hear. I mean, it's it's very, very disappointing to see this system in place. I think, as you would probably agree, this is one of those systems that I think was tried to set up for a certain purpose and backfired horribly. I imagine it was tried to, you know, be established to try to make sure that 
because obviously when you're flying, the lives of many people are in your hands. So they want to make sure that only, you know, the those who are in physical and mental uh, condition, which is you know considered good, are able to do this job. But to me, this just sounds ridiculous. It seems as though it's extremely prohibitive. And if anything, it's, uh, again, like you said, causing many serious issues to be undiagnosed, untreated. And again, if anything, I think it is just having an extremely adverse effect. If I had a say in things, I would abolish that. I think it should be more of a case-by-case basis, but I think all pilots, you know, should be treated. They, you need to get treatment for whatever issues you may have, physical or mental. It shouldn't cost you your job either. That's crazy. That's crazy. It's ridiculous. And again, I never knew that, so thank you for bringing that to light, but I, I have a feeling that this was initially established and set up for one reason, and obviously it's having, like we said, the exact opposite effect. So thank you for bringing that up, Ryan. I wish you the best of luck, and I hope you don't have any issues, uh, you know, in regards to one's health down the road. But I'm really sorry. I know it must be incredibly frustrating. You want to get the help with the depression, etc., but if you do that, it might cost you your job. It's incredibly unfair, and I hope a day comes where these these restrictions will be no more, or at least will be amended to, again, perhaps be more of a case-by-case basis and won't be so taxing and unfair to the pilots. So thank you, uh, Ryan, again, for, for letting me know this. Our next email comes in from an anonymous listener. No name was given. Good afternoon, Review Bra. I'm a regular listener and a lover of your podcast and YouTube channel. I've written a couple times, and I'm happy to say I've been able to find some time to write in again. Apologies for the heavy topic, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I recently signed up for a program in which I am now pen pals with an inmate on death row. Without going into too many details, I am a survivor of a crime which this inmate was convicted of on several counts. No connection between myself and the inmate, but it is the same crime. I am very anti-death penalty, which is why I'm interested in this outreach in the first place. But I will admit, I was hoping not to get paired with someone who committed said crime I was a victim of. Anyway, this situation has created an internal debate within myself, which I haven't thought about in a long time. Do I forgive the man who committed the crime against me? I don't think I do. Then I get into a kind of mind, F, where I think, what does forgiveness even mean? Can you forgive someone without excusing their actions against you? Does everyone deserve forgiveness? If I can't forgive him, does that reflect poorly on me? Am I unable to move forward with my life if I hold on to this hatred I have for my perpetrator? I feel like if I can't forgive him, it will weigh on my psyche, but I'm not sure I can. Anyway, I think perhaps the situation I find myself in with this inmate will give me some perspective and allow me to grow. What are your thoughts on some of my questions? I'd like to stay anonymous. So thank you for your email. Uh, Obviously, you know, you have certain feelings in regards to the criminal justice system and the death penalty. Now, I will say this right now. I don't see eye to eye uh, with you on that. Uh, When it comes down to the death penalty... I think the current death row system that we have uh, needs to change. I think it's, you know, it is to have someone sit there for 20, 25 years just waiting to die. In that span, the person may have a change of heart, and if not, it's it's just the, the, the current system that we have for death row is a mess. I will say that outright. And I think... It's something that does need reform. My personal take, and I would say probably 70% of people listening will disagree, um, but this again is just my view, and I'm not in any ability to change things, so I don't really understand why someone would get all that mad at me. So, you know, I have no say. My thoughts are meaningless here. Um, But I do support the death penalty, but I think... I mean, I do think that there are certain crimes... Uh, that should be punishable by death. 
and I do think that it is something that should be reserved for the worst of the worst. But that's just my view. That's something that I've thought about for a long time, but again, that's my view. Again, I, I think that the the death penalty, the death row, again, so to speak, needs quite a bit of reform, but I don't think the death penalty should be done away with. But again, that's just my two cents. Meaningless thoughts. Meaningless. My views on this are as follows. Don't extend forgiveness onto another unless you sincerely mean it. Just don't. That's my two cents. Insincere forgiveness It's better to do nothing at all than to say you're forgiving someone when you don't really feel that way. Just don't do anything at all, in my opinion. Because if you're not really ready to let the resentment or anger dissipate, and you do so anyway, it's not going to help. It's not really going to change one's views of this individual. It may not really change the situation, and it may cause further problems down the line. I think forgiveness is a very serious thing. And once again, I say, I only think that it should be done. It shouldn't just be something that's just casually said, oh, okay, yeah, it's all good. It's, it's all good. Don't worry about it. I know we made mistakes. It's okay. You know, it shouldn't be something that's just said like that, freely, casually. And I don't think you should do it because you feel you have to. I think it's a very serious thing. I think you need to give serious consideration to it. You need to think deep down, how do you really feel? Not even from the surface, but look deep inside. How do I really feel about this circumstance, about this individual? Am I ready to offer forgiveness? If you are, you are. If you aren't, you aren't. A time may come where you are ready, and a time may not. Everyone is different, and every situation is unique. But it's just not one of those things that, uh, well, I think it's what I'm supposed to do, so I guess I'll do it, but I don't really mean it. You You know, is that really sincere forgiveness? I don't think that it is. And in that case, again, I think it's better to just do nothing at all. So that's all. You just have to really think about the situation, You have to think about how you really feel about it. But if you're just not ready, you're not ready. There's no shame in that. It's okay if you aren't. And just go from there. Everyone's different. So thank you for your correspondence. This next email on a very similar topic, so I would say I will just lump this question in with the the last one. Uh, This comes in from Violet in the Republic of Moldova. We all had people in the past who hurt us in some way. Do you forget but don't forgive, or forgive but don't forget? Do pains from the past still hurt you? Now, you have a second question, but I'll first get into this one. Uh, Again, forgiveness is just an individual and circumstantial thing. In the past, for instance, when I was... I mean, here's the thing. And this isn't a good example. You know, I was going to try to cite this as an example, but it really isn't. I was going to say, well, do I forgive all of the people online who have said bad things about me? But I I don't because I have no reason to be angry at them to begin with. Oftentimes, forgiveness simply is, uh, you know, a result of either resentment or anger or frustration or whatever, but I just don't feel any way toward the folks who uh, say all these nasty things to me. So what's there to forgive when I don't think they've really committed any sort of offense? Um, there's not many people that I'm honestly all that angry at, to tell you the truth. So, that's just what it comes down to. I suppose I would just have to look back into my personal life. Like, well, when I was young and I was bullied, do I still have a grudge against the people that that bully me? No. Have I ever gone out publicly and forgiven them? No. No. But I hold no resentment toward them. It just is what it is. Stupid kids, you know? Every situation is different. It all depends. But, you know, again, I'll just tie that into the response from the previous email. Uh, Secondly, you have a second point uh, in regards to Crocs. Not crocodiles, but Crocs, the footwear. 
Uh, you write, didn't you criticize them? Why are they hated so much? To be honest, if this summer I will see them near me, I will buy them. I'll even buy the toe shoes. Those aren't Crocs, they're next level. You gonna call the fashion police? Uh, so thank you, Violet, for your email. Uh, I think Crocs... Now, I would wager, in regards to Crocs, you are probably taking a statement that I must have said back in 2014 or earlier. Um, my views of Crocs have simply changed. I wouldn't be caught uh, dead in that footwear. But if someone wants to wear them, let them wear it. I don't care. Uh, it's just not a footwear for me. But again, I, I don't care. You could wear whatever you want. So no, I won't call the fashion police, and I won't call um, anyone for that matter. You can wear whatever you wear, and if this summer uh, passes and you see a good pair of Crocs, I encourage you to purchase them. If you like what you see, get them, and uh, wear them with wear them proudly. Uh, be happy to wear them. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. I don't like the way that they look, and uh, that's all that there is to it. I wouldn't wear them, but that doesn't mean you can't. So by all means, you could wear them. Anyone can wear them. Even though I won't, you can wear what you wish. That's fine by me. In regards to shoes... You know, I just wear the same uh, black pair of uh, dress shoes for anything, pretty much. I uh, And that's all that I wear. I wear the same pair of shoes, you know, for anything, because that's just what I like wearing. Um, but some people will probably see the black shoes that I wear, and they'll say, oh, these look so dated, they look stupid, whatever. But, uh, you know, people can like what they like, and uh, that's all that there is to it. You know, but I have... It's like the shoes that I wear... I must have... I like them so much that I bought three pairs of the same shoes. So once I wear through this one pair, then I just will move on to the next pair, and move on to the next pair, and then I'll probably buy three more pairs. And Not that I go through them that quick, you know, but I just like to have a, a stash of them. But it's just the exact same shoe. I mean, it's exactly the same. And that's all that I ever wear. That's it, just the same thing, the same black shoes, because I like the way that they look. They're comfortable, they're formal, and they're versatile. So uh, what's, you know, to me anyway, what's not to like about them? I have another pair of uh, black dress shoes with slightly better grip on the bottom. And uh, I wore that when, uh, you know, if I, if I do a little bit of whatever work, around the house or something that requires a bit of traction, I'll wear that. But otherwise, if I'm just out and about, I'll wear my usual black shoes. Those are the uh, shoes that I wore in the Average Day video. I wear those every single day, pretty much, for any reason. Although I don't really wear them indoors that much. I usually... I'm one of those people that takes the shoes off inside. I, I prefer wearing socks, but... You know, if I were on camera, I would wear shoes. It's just it feels more appropriate that way. But anyway, thank you for your email. Wear the Crocs. Wear them and wear them proud. We have an email from John O. Hello, John. Hope you're having a good day so far, despite everything going on. I had the unfortunate experience of being involved in a hit and run where I was rear-ended and the other driver ran away after we agreed to pull over to allow traffic to keep moving. Now, this is not the first time something like this has happened. I was ran off the road by a car that drove recklessly through the rain. As expected, the other car did not pull over despite being 100% at fault. I also understand that you've been involved in harrowing experience with dentists who perform subpar work in a seemingly dishonest way. I also work in a field where people commonly lie, cheat, and take advantage of others to get ahead. Going through life, I'm really finding it difficult to have hope in people. I'm not saying by any means that I am perfect, or even have the right to judge others. I wonder what makes it so difficult for people just to do the right thing. This even makes me doubt that humanity is worth saving. However, I would like to have hope in humanity, and believe in the greater good. Do you have hope in the good in humanity? How do you see the good in others? Is there any good in people? I'd like to know your thoughts from a loyal listener, John O. 
Thank you, John, for writing in. I'm sorry to hear about the hit and run experience. I know it must have been dreadful, and I'm sorry that you had to go through that. Do I have hope in the good of humanity? I don't know. I don't trust people to do the right thing. I really don't. I'm just pausing because... I'm just trying to think of anything to the opposite of that, and I can't. I don't know what's going to happen. Part of me is convinced that we're just going to drive ourselves into the ground, and that's going to be it one day. But maybe not. By some miracle, we're still here. But I don't know. I don't know. I see people getting angrier and angrier. I see it in their behaviors. I see it in, in their actions. Some of the most despicable traits you can imagine people look up to. These are incredibly discouraging signs. I don't like the way things are headed. I think it's going to get worse. And I don't understand how it could change unless there's some sort of divine intervention or some sort of miraculous change of heart in so many people. The amount of narcissism that exists in this world, the selfishness, the lack of caring, lack of em empathy, the utter degeneracy, the cruel attitudes and the rampant psychopathy, it's hard to, it's hard to have hope with all of that. Maybe these behaviors always existed. Maybe they were always as prevalent as they are now. I, I really don't know. I mean, you know, look all the way back to the Bible, you know, with Nineveh. That, um, you know, that goes way back. But one thing undeniably today, of course, is that, you know, with the instantaneous communication through the Internet, uh, things can certainly get proliferated a whole lot quicker. Sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. You know, one thing that's kind of jaded me a bit, and sometimes I, I, I have different days. Sometimes I have good days, and sometimes I have bad days. When I look and at, look at humanity and society, and there's some days where I'm, I just it, it feels hopeless, and I just think, you know, maybe it's just best to just, you know, wipe the whole slate clean and let it just be done with, right? Maybe that'd be for the best. But then I try to say, well. Even if you sometimes get the impression that it's mostly bad, there still are good people out there, and they don't deserve to be, you know, done away with in some sort of calamity. And maybe it's possible that people can have a change of heart. You know, I mean, what does it say about you to, to think these sorts of things, you know? And I think, yeah, that's true, but... The other thing is that these attitudes, they really are like a virus. They can infect others. The anger, the frustration, all of it can get the best of anyone. You know, even someone who's much more mild-mannered and good-natured, it can, it can eat away at them, too. It could make a good person, you know, it can just get the best of us, a product of their surroundings. The truth is, I don't like a lot of what I see. I don't know what... I don't know what people inherently are anymore. Are people inherently good? Are they inherently evil? You know, sometimes I think, what if some people really are just born evil? I don't know. What if they are? You know, sometimes you hear these stories about people who... Always been, like... Just deranged and evil from day one. You hear these stories about how they were and... Then again, maybe it's a circumstantial, you know? Then you have to look, well, what was it like at home? What was... What were they around? How were they raised? You know, it's much deeper than that. And, you know, we all have to realize that. And I think there's genuinely good people out there that have things eating away at them. They're stressed out, they're upset. And if they were in a better circumstance, if they were in a better situation, they wouldn't behave the way that they do. You know, if just a few things were improved, if they 
if they still had that job, you know, if they still had that money coming in, if their relationship was going better, if they didn't have these troubles with their kids or whatever, maybe they wouldn't, they wouldn't behave the way they do. Maybe the anger, whatever, wouldn't, wouldn't be so apparent. Maybe it wouldn't exist at all. It's really tough. People just are the way that they are. Sometimes I think about the prospects of humanity down the line, and it scares me, but... I know it's nothing that I can control. The one thing I know that I can control is how I feel, how I live my life. I know I can control that. And one thing that I try to do, to the best of my abilities, I am by no means perfect, but I know how infectious so many of these negative characteristics in the world are. I try to not let myself get infected by them, but sometimes not necessarily the anger or the narcissism or the selfishness, but sometimes just the pure despondency that all of this can generate can, uh, it can bring you down. Even thinking about this, you know, it kind of does. Because to me, I just see the way that it is and I wish it weren't so. You know, I when I look through the comments, again, I... I read it all, I see what people say, but I still can't for the life of me understand what would compel someone to say these things, you know? I don't know. I don't know why people behave the way that they do at times, you know? I've watched videos and things that I think might be silly or I don't necessarily like, but I never leave a comment you know, just insulting and attacking the person with such vitriol. I never do that. It makes no sense for me to do that. Why? I don't know this individual. I shouldn't say that to them. I don't know. I guess my only hope is that I don't think humanity is going to get better. I don't think it's going to magically fix itself. I don't think that there will be any sort of magical change of heart. What I hope for, though, is that, you know, those who still try to be upstanding individuals, and I'm not saying that, you know, hopefully those that just have a little bit of good in them will still stick around and, you know, still try to let those characteristics live on. And hopefully people, maybe not even a ton, but just hopefully some folks will try to be, will try to strive to be better, better upstanding individuals. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Look, who's one to talk? But I just hope for a world where we treat each other a little better. Where common decency perhaps prevails. That I certainly hope for. Thank you, John, for writing in. All right, so there are two last emails that I want to get to tonight. And uh, then that's all that we have for the show. So this first email comes in from Grace in Montana. She says, I've been a fan of your YouTube channel and radio show for a long time now. I find your show and food reviews to be very relatable. As a very introverted, insomniac adult who hates mayonnaise, um, I also think you're very wise, always advocating for kindness and being yourself. And I respect that a lot. You've even inspired me to be myself, especially in what I wear. I really enjoy wearing older clothing, I don't have any suits, though, so I'm not that dapper, but I have always been afraid to express myself because I didn't like to wear what everyone else did. A few years later of building up my confidence and many hours of food reviews under my belt, I fully embrace my style. Just so you are aware, I don't even know you, but you are the coolest person I know. I first started listening to VORW online several years ago, And this last Christmas, I got a shortwave radio and some Report of the Week merch. Your show has also inspired me to get into radio as well as number stations, and it was super cool to hear you talk about them on VORW the other day. I love cryptography, and discovering number stations was the ultimate convergence of my hobbies. One of the first things I did when I got that radio was listening to the Christmas show, and I was so excited when I accidentally tuned right to your station and immediately recognized your voice. I heard you talking about you two on the show, and I know that you have a pretty wide music taste. 
I apologize if you've already answered this question before, but I was wondering if you had a favorite band or musician. If you had a favorite song, or a few favorites, or even if there was a genre you enjoy listening to the most. I plan to send in some artwork for a video when I get the chance, but the university coursework is relentless this semester. At least I have your radio show to help me get through it all. Thanks for being awesome, doing the show and the channel, and I wish you the best. Keep doing you. So thank you, Grace, for your kind words, and uh, I really appreciate it. It means a lot to hear that these broadcasts and and shows and reviews have really helped you to be yourself. Again, like I said earlier on in the show, I know that you speak the truth, and I know that you say that sincerely, and sometimes it's, well, it's it's incredible and amazing to think that <laughs> what I do, you know, little old me, is ever even able to help even just one single person out there. So I hope you know it means a lot to hear that. Thank you for your kind words. I'm glad also that you have a shortwave radio and uh, you were able to get some reception for the Christmas show. Now, in regards to your question, because... Now, I take it you've listened to a couple music shows. You know, you know I play some variety. Now, my favorite genres are on the rock side. Um, now, I, I will really give anything some consideration. I mean, I'll listen to anything. You know, you give me a song, I'll listen to it. And I play a bit of everything on my show. But personally, my favorite genre is probably alternative rock, especially alternative rock in the 90s and 2000s. I like grunge, post-grunge, indie rock, but again, even some of the classic rock I like. You know, the rock and roll from the 50s is pretty good. Of course, the 60s stuff is great. Um, so much of the 60s stuff, stuff, you know, even surf rock, psychedelic rock, you name it, all that stuff is good. Um, 70s classic rock, even some 80s stuff is good. I don't listen too much to the contemporary music, but again, some alternative selections um, from the last couple years are real solid too. So I'm really, I'm, I'm willing to give anything a shot. And I'll listen to some newer selections, some older selections. I mean, the other day, I was watching some clips from the uh, movie The Shining, and I was watching the scenes when, uh, you know, Jack was in the bar and he was talking to Lloyd, the, the, the ghost bartender. And in one of the scenes, you know, there was like a 1920s party going on there. And uh, the song Midnight the Stars and You was playing in the background. And I thought to myself, you know, that song is awesome. So then I threw that in the broadcast the other day and uh, played that at the end of the show. And, you know, that song is going back to the 1930s. I think it sounds a little older than that. But it was from, I think, 34. And still, I, I enjoy that stuff, too. I don't listen to it all the time. But, again, those classics are enjoyable as well. I'm, I'm really, I'm willing to give any genre consideration. Again, I'll listen to, I'll listen to anything. I'll listen to country, I'll listen to Christian rock, I'll listen to uh, just mainstream pop, I'll listen to hip-hop, R&B, rap, etc. But for the most part, again, I prefer rock and all of its derivatives. Now, I can't say I necessarily have a favorite song. I just listen to whatever I listen to, and it changes day to day. But, you know, some of my favorite groups are Oasis. Um, yeah, definitely Oasis. They're one group that I go back to again and again. U2 is good. There was a time when Third Eye Blind was my favorite group, but I just really like their one album and then a couple other songs off of their next one. I don't know, it's just like every group that has a considerable track record, I could always appreciate a few songs of theirs. Yeah, normally. All depends, but... It's more of the genres that I like as opposed to a particular artist or song. So that's what it comes down to there. So, uh, Grace, thank you for writing in. Thank you for your question. And, uh, you know, whenever you would like, if, if you do uh, make a piece of fan art, I'll be more than happy to feature it in the next broadcast. This final piece of correspondence comes from... A listener in Malaysia. 
and it goes like this. Hey, Review Bra, seeing that there's way, 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 way too much pessimistic, sad news in the world we live in, I wanted to say something at least a bit more lighthearted. This isn't an email asking you to take your opinion on something, but I thought it was funny, so I'll share it. The letter Z. Most people from the U.S., I learned, pronounce it as Z, whereas other places, such as the U.K., pronounce it as Z. When I was a small kid, I was always like, okay, Z. I get it, because a lot of people say Z, but Z? I watch many YouTube videos, and people that don't say Z always say it's Z. First time I ever heard Z, I laughed like crap, because where I'm from, everyone just calls it Zack. Thanks for reading, and have a nice day. I also wanted to include, in Mandarin and Cantonese, or any of these similar dialects, America is literally translated as the pretty country, or the beautiful country. Even though I'm not American, it's sad to see Americans literally kill each other just because they disagree on trivial issues. I wish that the USA changes and lives up to its name. The country is freaking called United States, but none of the states are united, which is depressing. Well, thank you for your emails, and, uh, yeah, you know, it is sad. I mean, (laughs) it's called the United States, but, yeah, sometimes it really does feel like it's anything but, you know? It's so much divisiveness, and there's nothing, almost nothing more I would like to see than civility return, and, you know, people be kinder to each other, and be more respectful to one another, and you know, while that feels like a pipe dream, there's I, I still hope one day that happens. But yeah, the letter Z, I mean, yeah, everyone over here just calls it Z, but I know, yes, in other parts of the world, it can be pronounced Z. I know on the shortwave, for instance, Radio New Zealand International, um, they always abbreviate it by saying RNZ News, you know, you're listening to RNZ Pacific, uh, etc., so I know that over there they do, yes, they say Z, and uh, it's used quite often in their shortwave broadcasts. And I just accept it. You know, linguistics are an interesting thing. I'm absolutely terrible at it because I, I forget so much, um, but I still find it interesting nonetheless, all the different variances. So it it is interesting. Some things make a lot of sense, and other things in regards to linguistics just are what they are, and that's the best answer you're going to get, or an explanation in that regard. So thank you for your email, and with that, that's all that we have for you in tonight's broadcast of VORW International. Thank you all so much for uh, taking the time out of your day or night and spending it here with VORW. It's an absolute pleasure to do this show, and remember, any feedback is welcome at VORW. I-N-F-O at gmail.com. Please don't hesitate to write in. It would be great to hear from you. Finally, if you enjoyed this broadcast, remember that it is your support that keeps it on the air and keeps it going. If you enjoyed what you heard, you want to hear more of it. Donations via PayPal are welcome at V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com or via Patreon at patreon.com slash the report of the week. Finally, if you would like to advertise on this broadcast, advertising inquiries are welcome at V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com. Just let me know you're interested, and uh, we'll go from there, and hopefully we'll be able to work it out. Until next time, please be safe, be healthy, and I wish you all the very best. Take care. This is V-O-R-W.